right, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, your host, Marla Wilson, and we have another exciting debate for you today. Protestant Eastern Orthodox has jumped in the TGT octagon, and we're gonna be talking about some church infallibility. You know, is church tradition infallible? We'll go a little more into detail with that topic, but before we do that, I do wanna go ahead and encourage you to like and follow the Gospel Truth. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you can stay in the loop of what the gospel truth has going on. The only way you can stay in the loop is if you subscribe and hit that bell. So if you plan on leaving the debate early, make sure you hit the subscribe and that notification bell now. All right, all this content is not only on YouTube, but also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So make sure you are flowing over to those over the other platforms and supporting the ministry and this channel with the follow and subscribe on those platforms as well. If you are just one of those individuals who rather just ditch the videos and not, don't care too much about the videos, you have the option of the podcast, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. So make sure you're flown over there to hit that subscribe button on those podcasts as well. And as always, I have a whole bunch of shows coming up here in the future that I want you to be aware of. Coming up after this debate, I have Turretin fan, Chris Date, the great hell debate. So that's coming up here soon i believe monday on the 23rd so make sure you are flowing here and hitting that subscribe button and that notification bell so you don't miss out on this debate chris date is one of the leading voices from the annihilation annihilationist position and you got two the fan who is big in this area topic and so we're going to get going so make sure you don't miss out on this debate after that is the physical nation of Israel still got special chosen people all right so this is going to be an eschatology debate these are Daniel Allgood has been on before but Luke has not this is Luke's first go around in a debate so I'm looking forward to these two individuals coming on and giving a great debate after that a good old Calvinist debate Rick Warren and Ricky Caldwell is total depravity true they have both been on before very good debaters so I know this one would not only turn out a great crowd but also will turn out to be an absolute solid debate because both of these guys are well able to defend their positions and following that and lastly does the bible and the church fathers teach justification by faith alone and this was a very highly anticipated debate and unfortunately this one had to be pushed back so we do have it scheduled again so i hope you guys are j hitting the notification bells and the subscribe buttons to make sure you don't miss out on this very very highly anticipated debate between anthony rogers and william arbridge so that said that is all the debates that are coming up the first the next four debates that's not all of them, but definitely the next four debates that are coming up here soon. So make sure once again to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the debates. All right. Uh, that said, I do have my guest here. I have Craig and Paul. And these guys are first time comers on a TGT platform, man. And I'm excited for these guys. Once again, this is a fun topic. I always get a kick and enjoy whenever we bring Catholics and Protestants together or Eastern Orthodox and Protestants together. It's a fun topic because you know we're going to be talking about Sola Fide, Sola Gracia, Sola Substura, and church tradition. All these things. All these things are are a part of this debate and i'm sure we'll probably touch a little bit on that today you know so i'm excited for these guys and let me bring these guys in so they can further introduce themselves to you how you doing fellas how's it going it's good to be going here. excellent Malin. all right so paul you are all the way from australia right how's it looking over there that's right it is a beautiful saturday morning here in australia uh, just past 10 a.m right now i've got a very nice view of the blue skies just out here so uh it's nice it's nice and chilly as well it's in our winter although it's not crazy cold like new york and uh, i've been there so i know what that's that's like that absolute box of death um in terms of cold <laughs> but uh yeah it, it really is but yes yeah, nice morning right now um very nice fresh awakened had a late night to finish up my uh to finish up the notes that i had um but otherwise got up ready to go it's great to thank you for having me all right, I'm glad you jumped on, man. Glad you jumped on early morning, early morning. Hey, Craig, so what's up with New York, man? How's New York treating you over there, man? Well, the weather's not cold anymore, thank God. And uh, I'm in a great part of New York. I'm not far from Jordanville, which is uh, the uh, headquarters of Russian Orthodoxy outside of Russia. 
Holy Trinity Monastery, and uh, I live near Syracuse. So uh, what's not to like? All right, all right. So, uh, uh, so you eat a lot of traditional Italian food, man. Are you are you big in the tradition? Are you just claim? Are you just Italian, or are you Italian Italian? What you got there, man? <laughs> Good stuff, man. Good stuff, you know, guys, it, man. It, it, believe it or not, uh, pretty much the real thing. I mean, in, in New York, we call tomato sauce gravy. So I make my own gravy. Uh, I have my own butcher up here. In fact, uh, on my a YouTube channel on Christmas, you could watch my wife and I pretty much cooking while doing a chill stream. So it's the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff. Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. So I'm a, we, you guys sort of gave us a little bit of a rundown with you guys uh, introduce yourself, but we're going to give you, I'm going to allow you to have time to introduce yourself even more. This time around, tell them what you do, though. Tell them your blogs, YouTube page, whatever content you got, man, so they can come check you out. You know what I mean? So start with Craig, man. Go ahead and give a, a quick introduction to yourself, man. Long story short, I'm Craig Truly. I'm an Orthodox Christian. I've been unwittingly now in apologetics for a few years. It really wasn't my initial goal. But at this point, I've been doing quasi scholarly material, which people could see in the blog. I pretty much read the councils because people don't want to put the work into it. But that being said, they could check that out at orthodoxchristiantheology.com. They could also just go on YouTube, Orthodox Christian Theology. It's pretty easy to find. And my main plug would be for the parishes in Cambodia who do the war in rush between Russia and Ukraine are cut off from most of their donors. And so for those who want to help support the spreading the gospel in Cambodia, support the Orthodox parishes there, you could go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. No HTML, no underscore or anything, just orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. All right, cool. Thank you so much, Craig, for jumping on here and giving a quick introduction. All right, Paul, you are up, man. Go ahead, give us a rundown of what you do, what you got, man. Yes, hello. So, as you said, my name's Paul, and my main online persona is The Other Paul for obvious reasons. People often like to ask, oh, I wonder who the first Paul is, and I think that's pretty obvious. But, uh, yes, so I do, I've been doing, um, I've been doing, at least casually, uh, some blogging and video stuff for maybe a couple of years now, but I started to, I, I did start to take it seriously rather a couple of years ago. And, um, and this is, this is more just pretty, pretty, pretty generic, pretty ordinary story. Me exploring into the depths of the Christian faith and trying to come as close to uh, the fullness of the truth as one possibly can. And so I like to do that with a special emphasis on the academic side of the faith, but also whilst remaining a fairly grounded, and down to earth, just real human being, unlike how many academics can just turn into just cold, hard robots that can't be understood by many people. So I like to, <clears throat> my whole mission really is to expound the the full depths of the faith into the academic level, where it, whether it include like languages or all sorts of historical context, things like that, but also to express it in such clear language uh, that people can actually understand it, but also provide all the necessary primary sources so people can do their own personal study and have their own knowledge of the issue uh, unimpeded by my own personal filter. And so my uh, my YouTube channel, the main area where I do my content is linked below the other uh, the other poll. That's the title of it. It is in, linked in the description. And I have a blog, uh, the other poll at uh, the other poll.blogspot.com. I'm not super active on it yet, and I am planning on bringing it to another platform. So that's 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 kind of up in the air. I have a few different uh, platforms you can follow me on, including a, a Discord server for, for people who like my stuff, the main hub. And you can find all those links in any of my video descriptions on my YouTube channel where there's links on the description and then there's a link tree as well that has all of my areas where you can find me on various channels. I'm also on Gab with the handle at, at Paulos, P-A-U-L-O-S, uh, because that site is, uh, I'm safe and I'm not going to be nuked from uh, for saying what I believe is the Christian truth, unlike what can happen any day to me now on YouTube. So do follow me there. Um, I'm a, and well, to actually describe my persuasion, I am a charismatic reformed Anglican, a set of words that people have probably never expected to hear in their entire life. And uh, the Anglican is a fairly recent one because I haven't been at a church for quite a while, thanks to issues of like lockdowns here in Australia, but I managed to find a new community in the Anglican church. And so I'm going to be committing to that. And, uh, Yes, that's me. That's my story. That's what I do. 
All right, good stuff, guys. Appreciate those introductions, man. So we ain't gonna waste any more time, man. We're gonna jump right into this debate. Once again, the topic is church, is church tradition infallible? We're gonna go into that topic a little bit and sort of expand on what that topic means. Uh, so we're gonna start that off with 10 minute opening. So we're gonna have two rounds of seven minute rebuttals. And we're gonna follow that with two rounds of cross-examination, seven minutes each. And then we're gonna have, uh, we've got five minute closings and then some Q&A from the audience. Sounds good? Oh, yeah. Right. All right, Craig, you're up first, man. And so I will start your time. Once again, you'll have the time up in your left hand, upper left hand corner, and you'll hear this little chime when you have one minute left to, to wrap up your presentation. So when you begin to speak, I'll start your time. All right. Is church tradition infallible? This is simple. Is there anything other than the scriptures, which we receive from the apostles, which is not open to question and preserved without error? Now, Protestants already make this presumption about the biblical canon. And honestly, if that's all we were out to answer, the debate's already over. The debate should not be focused on semantics, but ideas. The meat of this debate is whether there's an apostolic tradition preserved by the church there's a necessary addition to another infallible source of doctrine, the scriptures. And Orthodox, Christian the uh, Orthodox Christianity says that there is. There is a misconception that apostolic tradition is a whole other body of traditions unrelated to the scriptures. But in Orthodoxy, we call this sacred tradition. And sacred tradition is the harmony between scriptures and apostolic tradition. These are seen as interconnected, and the latter is necessary for interpreting the former. And this is not my own opinion. The dogmatic teaching of orthodoxy, according to the Council of Yassi in 1642, is as follows. The precepts of the church are two kinds, one committed in writing, which are contained in the divine books of sacred scripture, and the other delivered by the apostles by word of mouth. These, those by word of mouth, are the same, which the councils and holy fathers did afterwards more at large declare. And that's page 14, the open source version. The Council of Jerusalem, 1672, specifies that these traditions, it says in quote, whether by writing or word, have been preserved in dogmatic interpretations by, as it says, the fathers. And we can see that in question four. Now, these are not new ideas from the 1600s, but were taught by the early church fathers. St. Vincent de Lorenz explains in paragraphs five to six of the Commentorium, since the canon of scripture is complete and sufficient of itself for everything, and more than sufficient, what need is there to join it with the authority of the church's interpretation? For this reason, because owing to the depth of Holy Scripture, all do not accept it in one and the same sense. All possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always by all. We adhere to the consistent definitions and determinations of all, or at least of almost all priests and doctors. Now, Protestants claim that there's no interpretive tradition from the apostles necessarily joined to the scriptures. Now, I'm going to ask you, dear audience, is this idea scriptural? Now, if we look at Luke 18.10, Luke 24.45, they explicitly state that Christ taught the apostles correct scriptural interpretation. Luke 24.27 concurs with this by stating, He, that is the Lord, interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. But yet, the New Testament does not explain everything about Christ in the Old Testament. The New Testament explicitly states that these interpretations were taught by the apostles. St. Paul calls this doctrine. So, for example, in 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 8, he says the following about doctrine or apostolic tradition. He says, I urge you that you might command certain men not to teach a different doctrine. Some have, having missed the mark, have turned away to vain talking desiring to be teachers of the law, though they understand neither what they say nor about what they strongly affirm, but we know that the law is good if a person uses it lawfully. So as we could see, there's a doctrine, which was taught to Timothy, but not explicitly found in the scriptures, and a different doctrine, meaning one not taught to Timothy. Recourse exclusively to the scriptures, apart from this doctrine or tradition, is disallowed, as we see, because doing so is not using the law lawfully, according to St. Paul. Now, in Titus 1.5 and verse 9 as well, Paul expects the following from Titus on this note. He says, For Titus to set in order the things that were lacking and appoint elders in every city, 
holding to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, that he may be able to exhort in the sound doctrine and to convict those who contradict him. As we can see, the apostolic tradition is literally called the teaching of the apostles. Holding to this teaching enables the teaching of sound doctrine so as to contradict and convict those with a different doctrine. One can infer that these apostolic teachings were received from the apostles, given to the disciples like Timothy and Titus, and that those they appointed preserved their teaching. In fact, 2 Timothy 2.2 literally commands this. St. Paul writes, The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In fact, the proceeding that I just read shows that those who received the oral apostolic teaching were to teach others, who were then to go ahead and teach others yet again. So the proceeding is literally the orthodox teaching, and it directly contradicts the Protestant assumption that there is not a dependable, infallible apostolic doctrine slash tradition preserved by those appointed by the apostles, those appointed by those people, and so on. How else can the church, the living God, be the pillar and ground of the truth, as it says in 1 Timothy 3.15, if the church in no way supports the scriptures in an interpretive sense? Now, our earliest Christian documents explicitly attest to this. First Clement 44, which is written in the fir first century, um, St. Clement writes, Our apostles also knew, through our Lord Jesus Christ, there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned and afterwards gave instructions that when those should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. So as we can see, apostolic succession is a tradition, as he says, from the Lord given to the apostles, explicitly taught to those who the apostles themselves appointed. Now, St. Clement uncoincidentally follows the only normative model in the scriptures, where apostles appoint people who appoint other people, like we read in um, 1 Timothy 2, 2. No self-appointed leadership, as we see. The preceding, preceding is consistent with Orthodox sacred tradition model, because in 1 Clement 43, the very previous chapter, Clement claims that apostolic tradition isn't any new thing, but it's also found in the scriptures where he quotes Isaiah to that effect. Now, the Didache in chapter 11, this is another first century document, states, Whosoever therefore comes and teaches you all these things that have been said before in this letter, receive him. But if the teacher himself turn and teach another doctrine to the destruction of this, hear him not. So as we see, again, this idea of doctrine, which is the apostolic teaching, because there's things in the Didache that are not in the scripture. Now, St. Irenaeus, who wrote in the late second century, says as follows about apostolic tradition. Since the apostles, like a rich man, depositing his money in a bank, lodge in her hands, most copiously all things pertaining to truth, so that every man whosoever will can draw from her the water of life, for she is the entrance to life, all others are thieves and robbers. On this account are we bound to avoid them. But to make choice of the thing pertaining to the church with the utmost diligence, delay hold of the tradition of the truth. For how stands the case? Suppose there rise a dispute relative to some important question among us. Should we not have recourse to the most ancient churches which the apostles held constant intercourse and learn from them what is certain and clear in regard to the present question? For how should it be if the apostles themselves had not left us writings? Would it not be necessary in that case to follow the course of the tradition which they handed down to those whom they did commit the churches, right? Same thing we read in the pastoral epistles. Now we also find this from St. Hippolytus. And just so you know, the previous was against Heresy's uh, book three, cha uh, chapter four, paragraph one. Now St. Hippolytus in 43.2, in this turn of the century, second, third century document, he was trying to preserve apostolic tradition and he wrote the following about it. He said, for if all who hear the apostolic tradition, follow and keep it, no heretic will be able to introduce error. And Hippolytus also teaches the church is preserved um, from error in 43.4, where he says, God will reveal to those, it being the tradition, who are worthy steering the holy church to her mooring in the quiet haven. So we even see that the preservation of this tradition is something guaranteed by God. We have a minute left, so I'll jam through the rest of this.
Other first and second secondary sources, like uh, Mephilides to Diognetes, who claims to have been taught by the apostles, and St. Ignatius contained teachings on the atonement and ecclesiology, which are not explicitly scriptural, but they simply assume everyone would recognize these doctrinal teachings. This implies an authoritative view of apostolic tradition. So in conclusion, the scriptures and earliest church fathers explicitly teach there is an authoritative, infallible apostolic tradition that is preserved in the church. None of these sources teach that exclusive recourse is made to the scriptures. In fact, these sources explicitly contradict this notion. And as I did today, I was not quoting people centuries later. I was quoting the scriptures and extra biblical sources written before all the scriptures were finished or mere decades after the fact. So this is the consensus of the earliest church. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Craig, for that opening statement. So, Paul, you're up next for your 10 minute opening. I will start your time when you begin to speak. Excellent. Thank you, Marlon. And thank you, Craig, for that good opening. Now, in the presence of those who believed him in the Gospel of John, Jesus said this. If you, if you abide in my word, Logos, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. free. John 8.31 this establishes the infallible instrument by which he rules the church, his very word. The same is likewise throughout all of Holy Scripture. The word or words from the mouth of God are the solid foundation by which we test everything. The ultimate foundation was laid for us at Sinai and was supplemented until the last of the prophets. In all of them, we have the exhortations of the authority of God through his words, singular or words, plural, but nonetheless, which refer to the same thing. For example, after the death of Moses, Joshua is commissioned by God himself to take the promised land. Central to his commission of Joshua is to do, quote, according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you, Joshua 1.7. Here, so here we have the foundation of all life given to Joshua. The law, however, the, sorry, the law. However, he and the elders would nonetheless receive new active revelation from the Lord when needed, particularly for orders in the conquest. Likewise, many subsequent uh, prophecies would include the formula, thus says the Lord, or koch amar Yahweh in Hebrew, or putos legi kurios in the Greek Septuagint. Even those that do not use the formula nonetheless presume to communicate inspired words. Regarding the Old Testament in some, therefore, we must note something that remains the same across all these revelations. The very words themselves are what is inspired and unmovable, be they directly from God, speaking from the heavens, or through the mouth of an inspired prophet. It is these direct words which were then recorded and held to by Israel as the infallible standard of God himself, for his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Psalm 119, 105. And this can be found in countless passages, even by the mere use of the term word or words of God. There is tangible information that can be studied and gleaned from. In sum, the words of God are the infallible rule of faith. And now we move to the time of Christ, well after the last of the prophets died. He himself being a prophet brings new revelation from the father, whilst also appealing to prior revelation exclusively revealed in scripture. Indeed, in discussing the eschaton with disciples, he affirms that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. He then appoints apostles to whom he grants a prophethood that will receive every truth. Quote, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, literally into every truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 16, 12 to 15. Here, God promises to guide his apostles through the spirit, literally into every truth via revelation, that the spirit will declare what is the son's to them. This, coupled with the power to bind and loose, he gave to them all, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, establishes their prophetic authority. And this is the end of the trail in Holy Scripture. Divine revelation is now complete, and we now live according to what has been revealed until Christ returns. As Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is the paradigm that the people of God had operated on since the times of Israel. God inspires men to speak and the very words those men speak are the divinely guarded words of God and are what protect the truth since they are an objective source apart from our imagination. 
In light of this, I would like to posit two basic premises, which I believe both sides must accept for our worldviews to make sense. First, all sources of knowledge and wisdom must be assumed fallible unless shown otherwise. And we can know this fairly well, even just from human experience. We all have material limitations and imperfections of the mind. And so error of some kind is inevitable in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And that's not necessarily sinful error, just any kind of error. But this is likewise shown in divine revelation regarding the fall all throughout Holy Scripture. But in particular, for example, Paul in his letter to Rome describing the suppression of God's truth in the pagans and Solomon in Ecclesiastes observing how there is not one righteous man on earth who never sins. These among a myriad of scriptural proofs for the imperfections of man. And the second assumption is that infallible authority requires divine instantiation. And this ties strongly with the first premise and is the universal pattern attested in Holy Scripture. Divine authorities are divine by derivation from God. Moses and the Torah received their authority from God. All the prophets received theirs from God. The apostles were made apostles by Christ and who was given all authority by the Father, so on and so forth. A divine authority simply cannot evolve apart from God's revealed unction. This would be acknowledged by the Orthodox as well for sacred tradition, since the very claim is that it is apostolic. Now, let's consider what is asserted by my opponent that there exists an infallible source of truth, not totally separated, not totally separated from the words of God, but distinct from it and at least originally oral in form and which acts as the dogmatically binding and infallible interpretive authority of God's word, often called sacred tradition. I want the viewers to keep the particulars of this view in close mind for when my opponent cites scripture and indeed as he has just done and other sources of proof of such, because it is much more than just true oral traditions. A good summary definition of sacred tradition can be found in Orthodox Dogmatic Theology by Michael Pomazansky, translated by Seraphim Rose. After citing a key statement by St. Basil, which sharply contrasts written revelation with secret oral tradition, Pomazansky writes, From these words of St. Basil the Great, we may conclude, first, that the sacred tradition of the teaching of faith is that which may be traced back to the earliest period of the church, and second, that it was carefully preserved and unanimously acknowledged among the fathers and the teachers of the church during the epoch of the great fathers and uh, the beginning of the ecumenical councils. After this, he goes on to discuss the recording of sacred scripture, which is found in sources like the liturgies, hagiographies, ecclesiastical canons, and even the very spirit of the church's life. Something key to note, however, is the distinction between tradition in itself and its recording. The tradition is the totality of beliefs and customs passed on by the apostles to the church, the faith once for all delivered unto the saints, and is thus fundamentally abstract recorded in part after the fact by liturgies, councils, and so on. By contrast, the scriptures are the recorded words of God and not merely a gloss or reflection of such. This is extremely important to take note of. Given the norm of authoritative communication from Moses to the apostles, the concept of an infallible authoritative source of truth that is not composed of revelatory words is a true novelty. Rather than having ideas scrutinized by the words of God, or really the ideas taken from those words, a set of ideas is taken a priori as divinely authoritative in the interpretation of inspired words. This is fundamentally different. Now, let us taste, test this concept of oral tradition against our core assumptions. Given the, fallibility, the, the default fallibility of sources and the necessity of divine instantiation, we have a major problem. Nowhere in the apostolic accounts or those of their contemporaries or of the following generation is it attested that Christ or the apostles established a divine, infallible source apart from themselves or their own words. In this case, a unit of oral tradition distinct from their own words that would be infallibly preserved throughout history. This assertion is often taken to mean much more than it actually does, so I'll dispel of misinterpretations right now. This is not saying that there were never binding oral teachings or that later traditions popped into existence from nothing or that they are necessarily unreliable or that God does not providentially preserve core truths via tradition or even that traditions cannot be authoritative in some respect. Rather, the fact that no primary or even a nearby secondary account of Christ or the apostles records them establishing a monolithic, inherently infallible oral entity forces the believers to conclude that such does not exist. And in case my opponent goes there, likewise goes for the church in that the hierarchy or an emperor can call for conditions that make them speak infallibly. Christ and the apostles gave us their very words as the uncontested standard of divine truth. And there was no conception in their own words or of those who followed soon after that this was supplemented by another monolithic, infallible, abstract entity that could bind a certain interpretation to all believers, let alone an infallible body that could preserve such.
the only other instance from the time of Christ of a disembodied system of oral tradition unattached to divinely inspired words is the oral law of the rabbis. And with that, I save my time. All right, you finished a, a minute early, Paul. All right, so we're going to jump right into our rebuttal rounds. And once again, this rebuttal round is two uh, seven-minute rebuttals. So uh, start with Craig. You're up first for your rebuttal. Let me remove this time off the screen. And so, Craig, let me pull you up, and then you, you uh, I'll start your time when you begin to speak. Thank you, Paul, for your for your opening. I, I I got this overall sense from your opening statement is that ultimately we are pitting your logic against the scriptures. And what we hear is really not a holistic view of the scriptures on the issue, but really a logic. And if your logic's more compelling, it seems, then people are bound to accept it. But I would say that we're bound to accept what the scriptures teach on this and what everyone understood the scriptures to teach. Because again, the scriptures are more than sufficient. They're, they're all that we need for doctrine and faith. And usually this is what you get from Protestants making this. But I find that when those who import foreign traditions into Christendom, that what they end up doing is actually overturning the plainest of scriptures. Because what we saw in the plainest of scriptures is absolutely the sacred tradition doctrine. It's that there is a doctrine in the church. And it's not just the law, because there's those who use the law not lawfully. And that it's preserved in the church. And it's taught. It's, there's literally a succession of the three generations we could read in the actual um, pastoral epistles, like we saw in 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. Now, it might be 2 Timothy. I'm again the one or the other confused, but I could look up the citation, no big deal. Now, that being said, I think that we have to take a look at some of the claims that you made, and hopefully we have enough time to do that. That we say that uh, the words from God are the sole foundation of what's infallible. But the interesting thing is we don't have anything in Scripture that says that. We have nothing in scripture that says that thus saith the Lord is the only thing that is infallible, that there's no infallible interpretive authority. Um, we don't have that. And so the interesting thing is, I think this idea of an infallible uh, interpretive authority is exactly what we see in 1 Timothy 3.15 and what we saw in St. Hippolytus in 43.4 apostolic tradition. This, this isn't some like late medieval development. This is something that exists in the scriptures and from the earliest exegetes of the scriptures. And so I think that such an idea from my intercluder is wholly innovative because he'd be at pains to find anyone, anyone until the Protestant Reformation, they'd be calling the apostolic tradition into question and saying that it's fallacious or it's fallible. No one conceived of such a thing. And so I'm defending, I think, the presumed view, the consensus view, the only view that actually has any grounding in scripture whatsoever, being that the scripture gives a role for the church in preserving doctrine, literally explains how they do it, literally demands from us to preserve doctrine in that sense. And so if we understand sacred tradition as this harmony between the apostolic tradition and the scriptures, and so that it helps us interpret those scriptures, which are understood in types and in history and so many other ways, then... I find that the Orthodox view is the only one that actually has any explicit authority in the scriptures and the earliest church tradition. Now, you made the point that um, the very words of God or a prophet are inspired. And that is indeed the case. But I think that what often gets presumed is that the scriptures themselves are all qualitatively the same. And that every genre of the scripture thereby is going to be inspired in exactly an identical sense. And that's just not the case. As you pointed out, there is thus saith the Lord, where God literally speaks. But there's also things where the authors themselves speak. Like, you know, when Paul says, I say and not the Lord, but he ends 1 Corinthians 7 with saying, but I too have the Holy Spirit. And so there's things in the scriptures that are superintended by God, but they're not literally God speaking as in God's words. We see things in the scriptures, for example, between First and Second Chronicles and First uh, and Second Kings, where the numbers and the size of the armies differ. 
And now, of course, I'm not a radical skeptic. I believe that there is a inspired reason for these historical things that don't line up. But we have to realize that we're dealing with a genre in the scripture that is not prophetic when we're dealing with the histories. And for those Orthodox who never heard this before, they would have to read St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite. It says exactly that in his footnote in Apostolic Canon 85. Now, I think that you said very clearly that the spirit of truth will guide you into all the truth, right? And that's given to the apostles. But yet, we don't have something written down of what everything that is. And it's far too reductionist to say, well, it's only the New Testament epistles of those same apostles. Because in reality, those same epistles betray that they expect that people are going to know a doctrine that is not written down. Because that's what we just read about. And so the fact that Jesus made that promise about the giving the Holy Spirit and then leading the apostles to all truth, is the very basis of why there's an apostolic tradition and why guys like Clement and those who wrote the Didache um, uh, and, and others in these earlier sources took for granted there's an apostolic tradition. Now, I find kind of strange being that my intercalator is charismatic, that what do we make the New Testament, New Testament gift of prophecy, right? If, if it's something's a legitimate prophecy, well, wouldn't that be infallible? It's, it's from God. And so the question is whether the church has uh, prophetic gifts and the church does have prophetic gifts, then obviously infallibility doesn't stop the moment the last letter of scripture was written. Now, I also have another question, which is more of a rhetorical nature. Um, how is everyone wrong on this issue up until the Protestant uh, Reformation? Because for that to be the case, then that presumes the prophetic gifts of the church pretty much altogether ceased. There was no one preserving the church, the truth on this matter. And so I just find that indefensible given to the fact that we know there's a prophetic gift. We know that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We know that the normal means of the church being the pillar and ground of the church, the truth, is that doctrine is taught by the apostles to those who they taught, to those whom they taught, and so on and so forth. In fact, as Clement acknowledges in 1 Clement 44, this is something that Jesus himself taught ought to be the case. And he was writing during the time he knew St. Paul where he could have very credibly made that statement. You know, the dating 1 Clement is very likely before 70 AD. And so being that I only have 18 seconds left, um, I think I'll just stop my first rebuttal there and I'll pick up when uh, the other Paul takes his time. All right, thank you so much for that seven minute rebuttal. First of two, and Paul, you're up for your seven minute rebuttal. I'll start your time, you begin to speak. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for that good uh, good rebuttal, uh, uh, Craig. And I think it, it kind of went exactly as I was hoping it went, because remember viewers, what I said in my presentation, I was speaking a little bit fast and wanted to keep under time, but thankfully I actually finished early. But notice what I said as well. I'll read exactly what I said before in my presentation. That, uh, oh crap, hang on, let's not take too long. Um, so my assertion, my side of this debate in, in simply disputing the existence of an infallible monolithic unit of oral tradition, it is not saying that there were never binding oral teachings. And sure enough, what did Craig cite for his primary proof? scriptures by the apostles who discuss their own binding infallible oral teachings by nature of the fact that they're apostles this doesn't dispute that um or that later traditions popped into existence from nothing obviously not or that they are necessarily unreliable or that god does not providentially preserve core truths via tradition or even that traditions cannot be authoritative in some respect this is the key this is key to understand because virtually everything that craig himself cited affirms this and I agree with that, that tradition is a reality in the church, that the church does in fact have a role in has, has the key role in preserving the truth of God and that the gifts are active within the church. And, um, and that, and of course, to reiterate that there were authoritative, infallible binding oral teachings in the times of the apostles. Now, why does this not establish his case? Because once again, remember what the core claim is that there is an infallible units a holistic unit of oral tradition infallibly preserved and itself with the distinct from scripture distinct from the words of scripture and which thus has the power to dogmatically bind the interpretation of scripture 
that is not the same thing as what is being said here. And, and to make my thing further, I'm not even necessarily just saying scripture. I'm simply saying the words of God. Now, it just so happens that all the words of God we have today are in fact in scripture. I mean, the literal spoken words, written spoken words of God, they all happen to be preserved in scripture, but that's the that's logically prior to them simply being scripture. And that's why I emphasize that. Because we look at, for example, when Paul's urging Timothy to follow, uh, let's say, for example, in 2 Thessalonians, because that, that could be another passage he could cite, but uh, I, I know he doesn't go the normal cheap route from uh, many other apologists, um, but it's a good example anyway, where Paul exhorts Timothy to follow the traditions given to them, communicated to them, sorry, he exhorts the Thessalonians to follow the traditions given to them, whether by letter or by word of mouth. And that is true. Those are oral teachings. Those are binding. Those are infallible. But why? Why are those oral teachings given by Jesus, by the apostles, which they assume the other people had, are binding and infallible? Why are they? Because they are the actual very words of the apostles and of Christ given to these people, which they then understood. Do we have any preserved statements of the apostles outside of writing? Does oral, the sacred oral tradition in orthodoxy claim to preserve exact words and statements from the apostles from which we can then use an objective measure that's not merely the abstractions of the mind of someone who claims to have sacred tradition. No, we do not. Sacred tradition is fundamentally abstract. That's why I point to that. And uh, when he, when Craig says that this is merely an assumption that only the words of God in the, that when I say that merely, only the words of God are infallible and all that, well, that's not an assumption. That's simply the pattern throughout all of the whole Old Testament. The assumption is that what God says is authoritative, infallible, and binding. And as I said with the assumption, Ed, the first assumption, it's a necessary assumption that we take all sources as fallible. Again, not unreliable, not dead wrong. Something can be 99.99% correct and everything. You could have a phone book that is 100% correct without error, and yet it's not infallible because it's not divinely guaranteed. That's what I mean when I say that. And so with that, when you consider this, this is a necessary assumption when we approach scripture, when we approach just religious life in general, that nothing is in and that nothing before us immediately can be assumed as infallible unless we take it as way, unless we uh, figure that out as such, unless we find that it's infallible. And this can go into a whole discussion on what are the marks of credibility and all that. That's a whole other discussion for another day. But point being, given our common foundation in Holy Scripture, what does it say? What is the repeated pattern, the universal pattern, time and time again, that is that is stated? It is that whole. It is that the inspired words, whether directly from God or through a prophet, are what are used as a measuring stick, not an disembodied, abstract tradition. And I mentioned that this is how actually the oral law of the rabbis operate. And, and it depends on who you ask. Some of them uh, who are more radical back in the day would say that Mishnah was word for word given by Moses, but otherwise not necessarily. That it otherwise just simply be the teaching tradition used to explain the oral law, just as is the role of sacred tradition in Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism and others today. And the reason why I raise this is because particularly if we look at what standard Christ uses, he opposes their tradition in saying that you nullify, you cancel out the word of God with your tradition. What was their tradition? Fundamentally abstract statements uh, abstract beliefs, abstract claims, which they claim to have come from Moses. And what does Jesus compare them to? Does he here or ever refer to God once God once said here in abstract form and it's not in itself preserved in scripture, but I'm bringing it to you now? No, he appeals to the scripture. Have you not read? It is written. Or he, re he appeals to new revelation he himself is receiving being a divinely inspired man of God or literally the God man. And of course, Jesus and the apostles may appeal to things that are not directly found in scripture, but that doesn't prove sacred oral tradition either because the process of this is that they see what's in the scripture and well, they're inspired. So they're capable of seeing things that we ourselves won't be able to. So that's not really a, that's not really a, a major point either. But either way, you can discern new truths, or not really new truths per se, but more complicated truths of Holy Scripture for that, that is otherwise not explicitly what they say, but nonetheless what it necessarily leads to it. The classical Protestantism, Protestantism has always granted that. Classical Protestantism has always taken the, that the traditions of the church are in some sense authoritative. It's simply that abstract oral claims are not in themselves infallible and thus cannot be used as an infallible dogmatic tool for binding the interpretation of holy scripture now certain more high church uh, protestants may disagree with me and that will be another discussion but that's my main thesis
overall. This is not simply saying that we don't use tradition, we don't have tradition, that we never rely on tradition. Of course we rely on tradition, even just to know who wrote the Gospels. That's why it's a good thing that neither of us go on the epistemic death spiral of, oh, well, you don't have infallible certainty, therefore you can't know anything. That's ridiculous. We both reject that. And I'm okay with that. I can settle for moral certainty or even not necessarily always moral certainty. We can know the truth, but the question is, what is infallible? What is divinely guarded from error? And I cede no more time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your first rebuttal. And now we're transitioning to the second round of rebuttals. And Craig, you're back up for your seven minute rebuttal. And I'll start your time when you begin to speak. Thank you, Paul. Let me repeat this again, because I, I feel we're back to where we began. I feel this debate's reducing itself to logic versus the scripture, logic versus the scripture, logic versus the scripture. And before we're so sure of that logic, we have to be aware that I think what my opponent is demanding is this, he's making this appeal to endless specificity concerning the term infallible. And we have to remember the scripture's not using that word infallible. I actually am not aware of the top of my head like anything within the first thousand years of church using that term infallible. And so if we become so hyper-focused on where are you going to find something that's not abstract enough, that's more concrete, that we could rightly call infallible by my own definition of infallibility, then this debate will not go anywhere because that's just not possible. We, we have to use the term infallible in a way that'd be more applicable to what would could actually be understood at the time that these scriptures and early church tradition existed. And so let me just say this very basically. Is the church going to get these things right or is the church not going to get these things right? The presumption in the scripture in 1 Timothy 3.15 is the church is going to get these things right. The presumption in the scripture is that doctrine is going to be preserved in the church, that this is going to be through the teaching function of the church by those appointed by the apostles, not by self-appointed teachers, uh, not by this private interpreters of scripture, but those actually appointed by the apostles given their tradition and those who got received that tradition from those from the apostles. That's explicitly in the scriptures. And so if we start overturning the simplest interpretation of the scriptures because of some sort of a logical necessity, I feel that we've then put logic on top of these scriptures, which I don't think is appropriate. Now, you said, well, it's it's too vacuous and abstract, you know, what the something really written by the apostles is outside the scriptures. Well, for one, that's not the case. Obviously, the liturgies come from the apostles because you could go to India, you could go to the Anglicans, you could go to the Lutherans, you could go to the Eastern Orthodox, you could go to Roman Catholics, and there is, and you could go look at early sources like St. Apollotus. They consecrate the Eucharist using identical wording. How on earth does everyone across all these cultures, all these times, all these even doctrinal events, how do they all get that the same? Because obviously that's from the apostles. And obviously that's these same words, like uh, it's right to give our thanks and praise. And these things we find in all their liturgies does not exist in the scriptures. Now, another point I'd like to make is... It's not abstract because we do have a criteria, which I did not fail to quote when I quoted St. Vincent de Lorenz. He said that what is um, bleeds by uh, bleeds by everywhere um, from all time by all must be that early tradition. And he interprets that to be the correct interpretation is all sufficient scriptures. And so if we the life of the church, as uh, Paul kind of dismissively reads the words of Pomazansky, you know, this is something that could be evident once everywhere by all. That means something. You can't ignore it. It might not be concrete enough for you, but how about everyone receiving the same canon of scripture? Yes, some had 65 books, some had 67 books, a select few had 73 or 74. You know, whatever the numbers are, the point is we get a lot of agreement about a core set and that gives us very good certainty. I would say infallible certainty that, yes, that's the scriptures and that we don't have to have any existential crisis what the scriptures are. But ironically, it's by using the actual criteria of St. Um, Vincent de Lorenz. And so if we ignore that criteria for everything else that's out tradition, but except for the scriptures, we just show ourselves to be hypocrites. And... I don't think the early church are hypocritical on this issue, which is why right off the bat in Clement and the Didache, 
and Irenaeus and Ignatius, they just presumed people understood all of these inferences from tradition because it's something that everyone's always believed up until the Protestant Reformation. This is the, the default position. This is the position of 1 Timothy 3.15 and St. Hippolytus and apostolic tradition, like I said in 42.4. This is not an innovative idea. The Protestant idea is innovative. Now, that being the case, I find it interesting that my interlocutor quotes Jesus claiming that the, uh, the oral, Torah, oral Torah is like the traditions of men. And this is a sort of like abstract thing, which is so in common with what the, um, with let's say Orthodox sacred tradition. But this really doesn't make a lot of sense because that oral Torah is recorded. It's in the Talmud. You know, this this would have been something that just because maybe at the time of Christ, it wasn't codified in the paper as far as we know. Maybe better Talmud scholars could tell me otherwise, but not that I'm aware of. Maybe it was a committed to paper at that time, but there wasn't a lot of doubt as to what these rules were. You know, th that, that wasn't the issue. The issue was these weren't actual traditions. These weren't from God. In fact, they were devised in which to, circ to circumvent the actual teachings of God. Now, Christ didn't say this, well, then how do we undo this? Well, you interpret the scriptures by the scriptures. There's, Christ doesn't give any sort of hermeneutic in order to deal with this. Um, instead, he vindicates through miracles that his teaching is the truth and that those will know prophets by the fruits, that they do good works. And so it's from the church being the church the church working miracles, the church having prophetic gifts, the, the church preserving doctrine, the church doing these things that actually shows that the church has is true. Um, I have only a minute left and that kind of distracted me a little bit. So let me collect myself for a second. So that being said, if we're going to ignore what the scriptures actually say about the preservation of doctrine, what the earliest father said about the preservation of doctrine, then unlike the oral Torah, which came centuries and centuries and centuries later, and on its face contradicted plain stuff in the scriptures like Corbin and stuff like that, where, oh, you know, you, could, you don't have to help your parents and honor your parents, so that's one of the Ten Commandments because you could just put your money in a bank account in the temple and use it for yourself. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that's wrong. That sort of Jewish legalism is what Christ and St. Paul and others wanted to correct. That's why to this day in Israel, the elevators stay on in every floor on the Sabbath because they think that's work. These sort of ridiculous hyper-legal things for people to actually break the rules of God saying they're following the rules. That is not apostolic tradition. Apostolic tradition is the correct interpretation of the scriptures. It's what we see in the scriptures. And with that, I'll see the rest of my time. All right. Thank you so much, Craig. And Paul, you're back up for your second rebuttal. So I will start your time when you begin to speak. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Craig. Um, I likewise feel that we have to go back to just to square one here as well, because once again, viewers, remember, what did I say? I'm contesting the specific assertion of a distinct oral entity of that's comprehensive of all tradition, infallible in itself, infallibly preserved by the apostles all the way to today, or at least up until it's codified in liturgies, hagiographies, canons, all that jazz. I'm not contesting the church's role, the church's authoritative role in preserving the truth, that God, by his Holy Spirit, will ensure that the church preserves the truth of God. Not In, in fact, not even merely just in the infallible inspired words, which indeed are the default, but also in the, in the how would I say, it, in the necessary implications of the divine revelation, such as, for example, the Holy Trinity and such. All I am saying is that there is not a category, there is not an authority given. Again, given the necessity that divine authority is derived, it is not simply assumed, it is derived. And uh, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, I find it kind of weird why Craig would say, well, we'll talk about, well, at the top of my head, nowhere in the scriptures say that they're not infallible and uh, that they're not infallible or they don't use categories like infallibility and that. And I'd say on its on its face, that could technically be true, but I'd simply also say it's a necessary consequence of what we do have in Scripture with the demand to simply follow the word of the Lord um, without error. And likewise, for example, with Samuel, when he says that God is not a man that he should lie or that all Scripture is God breathed, ready for correction, reproof, all that stuff. And given that God cannot lie, nor can he be in error, 
And again, that's sure. This is assuming things which nonetheless we can garner from scripture on the nature of God, on his transcendence and all that jazz. Point being, this can be constructed from scripture itself. And I'm I'm, I'm kind of confused why Craig would say I'm pinning it as logic versus the scriptures. Whereas all I'm doing is what he himself is, well, attempting to do. I don't think he's succeeding, but nonetheless, what he's attempting to do and, and garner what the scriptures themselves say, the pattern that they draw out for us. All I am simply doing, I'm not putting up a logic against something. And when I do give my assumptions, I have been very clear with establishing my assumptions and likewise appealing to them from Holy Scripture. And this is why I appeal to not just any specific passage, but the whole testimony of Holy Scripture that it doesn't necessarily say only the words of God are infallible and inspired, but that is what it assumes all throughout consistent contrast of the words of God with the words of men that only that throughout of it, the entirety of the scripture, 10 out of 10 times, no variation, all that which is infallible, divinely inspired is inspired by God, comes from God. I'm simply following that logic consistently and applying it to the assertion of a singular unit of oral tradition, that there is this body, this unit of oral tradition that is perfectly infallibly preserved from the apostles and through certain leaders of the church for it to be only for it to be infallibly uh, articulated at certain points in various contexts like councils in particular. Once again, this is not a denial. Well, here's, here's the thing I could easily throw back truly his own thing of logic versus the scripture. You're, you're assuming a certain take, Craig, of the scriptures when they say that when they talk about authoritative apostolic tradition, I agree that existed. That's what I already said, that at that time, people heard the living words of the apostles. Those very oral words were themselves inspired because of the inspired source they came from. I don't deny that. And yet here's the thing, where are they now? That's, that's what I'm saying. We don't, we don't have those oral statements preserved to us today, apart from what was written down by God's providence, by God's grace. And that's the best explanation for why everything was written down in the first place, the very words of Christ and the very words of the apostles and thus preserved, which would almost be superfluous if we did have this infallible oral tradition um, that doesn't deviate in any respect, even in a major way. And of course, Craig responds by pointing to certain liturgies about how they happen to be across the world and they just so happen to have the same words. So maybe they come from the apostles. Well, if you can, I, I, I don't know which ones he's talking about. He didn't really give many examples apart from just a vague reference like India here or this and that. Um, if he could give those examples and if he could demonstrate historically um, to demonstrate the thesis that they really did come from the apostles themselves um, and they weren't simply agreed upon very early so that by the time that uh, for example, Matthew or Pantinus went to, or to, sorry, Thomas or Pantinus later on in the third century went over to India and happened to preserve the same words. If he could demonstrate that those are from the apostles, I'm like, great, fantastic. Guess what? You just demonstrated more scripture. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not merely, and this may be partially my fault. This isn't merely me saying scripture versus non-scripture. I'm not, I'm not putting it that simply. It is the words, inspired words of God, which includes the written and the oral. But the point is that Orthodox tradition does not claim that its sacred oral tradition is a collection of inspired words and statements, but simply abstract statements, which fundamentally subsist in the minds of fallible men. Whereas the inspired words are simply there in themselves. Yes, they require context. They require proper interpretation well, with regards to using context and language and all that jazz. And yet these things can nonetheless be reliably gleaned from history. And yet Orthodox tradition with the, again, potential exception of a highly specific exception of statements in liturgies um, regarding the consecration, for example, with the exception of that, it's not based on inspired words, but abstractions that are interpreted throughout time, which we demonstrably see are not infallible. Such as, so he will point to, for example, the rule of um, the rule of uh, Saint Vincent de la Ronde. I think that's a great example. What was agreed everywhere, by always by all. Well, here's the thing: does the consubstantiality of the Father pass that test? In the mid fourth century, no way. There was huge opposition, and it was even a, a, for a certain period imperial law, imperial is sanctioned the uh, homoousian position that of like substance, who still affirmed that Jesus was God from God, and yet there was still there was hundreds of bishops especially in the East, but also in the West, who would nonetheless affirm the homoousian, I'm sorry, the homoousian and also the straight up heterousian position. So on the basis of how, how do you judge that? 
on the basis of a sacred oral tradition. What is the sacred infallible oral tradition? If such a thing existed, how come the majority of the Christian world would come to oppose such a core element of this sacred oral tradition with respect to the Trinity, that being the consubstantiality of the Father and Son? Not saying that you can't find it logically implicated in earlier authors, but such a widespread disagreement begs a question against such oral traditions. And I could say so much more, but my time is up. All right. Good stuff, guys. I uh, appreciate the openings and the rebuttals. Good stuff. Good stuff. So now we're going to jump into the fire round. Everyone's favorite part of every debate, which is the cross examination. Once again, this would be two rounds of seven minutes each uh, for to cross, cross examine. Uh, in that, uh, if you can answer, answer the question with simple yes or no, please do that. We do not want to bog, time, bog down your opponent's time. Uh, that said, Craig, you're up first to cross examine Paul for seven minutes. All right, Paul, how is the church the ground and pillar of the truth, like it says in 1 Timothy 3.15? Because it receives the inspired words of Christ, the apostles, Moses, the prophets, all that jazz, and is guided by the Holy Spirit in order to reach the truth, even if it does stumble along the way. Now, the stumbling, is this something that could last near indefinitely, year after year for centuries? Um, I don't know. That's still that's still a topic I personally investigate. I to what degree is the church indefectible? Which itself begs the question on what is the church? Is it necessarily strictly visible, or is it simply the collection of the elects? All that stuff. Um, so that's a question I still investigate uh, myself, and my conclusions will be, of course, well, how affected could something by be the ground and pillar of the truth? How could something be the ground and pillar of the truth if really it's not the truth? Is like you said, it's it's so abstract no one's preserving it it's just maybe there's some elect somewhere that have it I'm, but i'm not i'm not saying that though am i i'm not saying no one's preserving it i'm simply saying that how it sounds the to church me. that and to be more specific as well that any entity within the church be they certain hierarchies bishops anyone that it just it simply can uh, it can make a mistake no matter how reliable it is it could be insanely reliable and that's good we can rely on that if that's the case what but i'm just, what I'm just simply saying it scripture? doesn't have an that sorry not sorry not the church i want to keep this focus on oral tradition just that there can be mistakes in oral tradition simple as that well how what kind of promise the scripture is that the church is the ground and pillar of the truth where it doesn't act as a very good ground and pillar for pretty much most of christian history up until the 1500s well where, where where in can you repeat that where in scripture does it say that or well, how is the church being the ground and pillar of the truth a good promise to the scriptures if it doesn't really ground or pillar or any truth? The truth has pretty much been lost for hundreds of years. Just like in the real world, can you explain how that can make sense? Well, first of all, begs a question on when on that passage itself, what is Paul talking about when he talks about the church? And I believe he is actually in reference specifically to the local church. And of course, we both know that local churches can err and quite spectacularly even. So, um, so, but to answer, even granting that this would apply to the universal church, I'd say that this is the normative status of the church. And so long as the church is preserving the scriptures, even if it does uh, widely, the wide portions of the visible church, even if they do get into great error, Nonetheless, they still preserve the very words of God and there's still good and truth within them, even with great error. And so a pillar and a foundation, yes, the church is that. Pillars and foundations can be chipped at. They can be highly damaged. And yet the beautiful thing is that I believe well, in God of the resurrection. let's test how highly damaged they could be because you're saying highly damaged as in really completely gone and resurrect as phoenix from the ashes. So what happened Another... to the interpretations of Christ in Luke 24? Were they lost? Well, so what was that passage? What did he say there? Well, in Luke 24, where Christ gave the uh, understanding of where he was in all the scriptures, being mm -hmm. that he taught that to the apostles, where do we have that now? Is it just lost? No, it's there by the fact that Christ's words are recorded. But I mean, what he taught them, though, is what he taught them lost. What he taught them, as in... Not the words that he what? taught them, but what he taught them where he was in all the scriptures. Has what he's taught been lost? No, it's not. He does actually discuss it multiple times throughout the uh, throughout the scriptures, and uh, well, elsewhere about where you can find him within the scriptures. He discusses that in multiple areas preserved in the gospels. But for also, all the scriptures? Um, also, for also, all also, scriptures? even even within for even the within scriptures? the later tradition of the church. For all the scriptures, something's had Sorry? to be lost, right? 
all the interpretations sure. of Christ for all the scriptures? The, 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 we have all of them? Yeah, no, we don't. No, we don't. As, of course, the ending so that, of John so himself So they lost them? Because they weren't lost the time that so, they said it to them, right? The words, the words were lost, yes, but not necessarily all the interpretations. And that's not what I'm arguing. I'm not arguing that we've so, lost so because we lost why did, So why did God inspire St. Luke to write that this occurred, that Christ gave all interpretations where he was in the scriptures, if this is meaningless to us because it was lost? But I'm not, I'm not saying it's meaningless. I'm not saying we've lost the interpretations. I'm simply saying that oral transmission is not necessarily infallible. You can have great certainty. Where, with it. Where, the church where, where are these many your, many but you're not answering the question. Where are these interpretations? You can find them elsewhere in scriptures where Christ does in other points discuss. His but, own, but again, do we find all of them? The do we find all of them? And you can find, find them and them? no, you don't. You find I'm all not pretending that we do. We're not answering the question. Let's move on to the next one. Isn't the canon of the scriptures an apostolic tradition we preserve that's found in the church? Sorry, can you repeat that? Isn't the canon of the scriptures an apostolic tradition that is preserved and found in the church? The canons of scripture, it's plural, yes. The canon is. of the scriptures. Okay. And so we got that, that right. In. Can you say that you cut out a bit? We, do we have that right? The canon of the scripture or canons, if you are willing to be a little more flexible? I believe we have great moral certainty on the vast majority of books um, and uh, including both in all in New Testament. Others are less certain, but we nonetheless have a great enough certainty to which we can say this is a foundation. Yeah. But you want to say that any canon is infallible? That any of our own uh, reflections of the canon, there is the objective canon, of course, in the mind of God, but in any of our own canons that we come to, no, not necessarily because our own faculties are so, fallible. So we can't be absolutely certain that the Gospel of John is a scripture. Can't be infallibly certain, but you can, with sober historical method, so, yes, you okay. can be quite certain. You can be very certain. All right, certain. so we're not infallibly certain the Gospel of John is a scripture. Um, no, no. Question. Why uh, does Ignatius, like in Smyrna's chapter 1, Trillian's chapter 9, and Irenaeus quote creeds, demanding those listening to stop their ears and any other teaching if there's no expectation of a definitive tradition to appeal to? Because they're true. I... Simple as that. Is he, is he where in this, where in those passages, I'm oh, sorry, it's not my questions. I'll simply say that no way right. in those passages, nor in those you quote from Irenaeus, do they say that there is an infallible entity, a comprehensive infallible entity of oral tradition. They can point to moral certainty of the agreement of the churches, for example. That's not the, the same thing as them saying that this is a distinct inspired body. That's the distinction I want us to make really clear. Do you feel in reality you place almost no authority in tradition, no matter how early and generally authentic it is by historical standards? Absolutely not. In fact, I use First Clement, for example, quite frequently in multiple topics as an authoritative interpreter of the words of Paul regarding justification, uh, gender roles, even something like that, as well as the institution of the church offices. All right. All, All right, right, Paul, you're up for your seven minute uh, cross examination of Craig. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so my questions are quite jumbled up, so forgive me if I take a little bit to get to one or the other. So, uh, Craig, how do you judge which which sacred tradition is, whether it's the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, the Oriental, the Assyrian Church of the East, and any others, how do you judge which one of those is the sacred tradition of the apostles? We'd go by what the consensus of the church is. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the unanimous consent of the fathers pre-second Nicaea on images? On images? The veneration of images. All right. Would you say that's the case for the first through fourth centuries, the veneration of images that's permissible? Yeah, absolutely. The only, the only explicit evidence we have is that the majority of people were, were venerating images, even in the anti source sources. Where is this in the first two, fourth centuries of sources? For example, well, Tertullian makes mention he, in criticizing the uh, the image of Christ on a um, on a chalice, and pretty much he says that he's the minority on this view. We have Saint Apollos speaking of those who make pagan art should be taught to be, make something new, and so they're still making art. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Are Eusebius they... speaking of statues. We we have Eusebius speaking of statues we claim are from the first century, though. More realistically, they'd probably be from the turn of second, third, because he was born in 260. Yeah, and he says people blind. are venerating them. And so pretty much whenever we hear of popular practice in any of these sources, the popular practice is a kind of dualia. Mm 
Okay, so in those sources with Tertullian and Hippolytus particularly, are they saying that, are they criticizing people for venerating images? Um, Tertullian is and St. Hippolytus isn't. Where does, where does Tertullian say that people are venerating the chalice? Well, it's a chalice. And so the chalice is used for the, the Eucharist. So I, I can't see how it would just be because it looks pretty. Okay, but he doesn't mention that's he doesn't mention that as a criticism though that people are venerating the chalice. No, because the the context of the passage is him complaining about the shepherd of Hermas. This is Tertullian, after all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's not doing that. And uh, likewise, Hippolytus is he complaining about people venerating images that they're painting, or merely the fact that they are making such idolatrous images? No, he's saying that those who formally done it for work ought to be taught to do something else. Which is just, just something else. He or... just leaves it at that. It doesn't get more specific, but being that they're, they're metal workers in art they're it's going to be something that has to do with their craft. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so with, res so with respect to that, so neither Tertullian nor Hippolytus, they make reference to the veneration of images in opposition. And now you mentioned Eusebius. So you, you say that Eusebius mentions people venerating the, uh, the statue, I believe, I believe particularly the one with the issue with the woman of blood, or am I thinking of a different one? I think that's the right passage if I remember right. And he says that some sort of plants that work miracles were near it, if I remember right. Right, right. Well, I, I, I read that passage myself a while ago. I don't remember him mentioning veneration, but let's say he did. What was Eusebius's own? Do you know Eusebius's own personal testimony on images in the church? He was against images of the church, though, he, though wherever he traveled, he saw them, they're ubiquitous. Whether it's the image made without human hands, and he said he's seen portraits, the apostles and of Christ that are lifelike, which is a bit of a stretch. I've seen some of this old art. doesn't look that lifelike to me. Um, but he was saying, I'm against something, but I see it everywhere I go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So Eusebius does see images. Likewise, do other authors such as um, who's the who's the Pope that commends someone for stopping image veneration, but denies smashing. He doesn't want him to smash him. I think this is one of the Popes of Rome or Constantinople, I'm trying to think, who commends one of the other bishops for um Is this a question? Stopping I, 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 I don't, I'm trying. I'm, I'm just trying to remember because there was one either bishop of Rome or whoever. Anyway, anyway, so we do have evidence of images existing, and at least one practice of people venerating a uh, certain statue in the in the fourth century from you see. And, and okay. one additional is thing that, is that good enough to establish? Ex... A... Yeah, because we got an extant grotto in Jerusalem where there's graffiti that literally says the image of uh, the image of M is adored. And um, so, meaning Mary, for those who are trying to piece together what M is. And so that when being said, that the only excellent evidence we do have is that they were used for veneration to infer that they're, oh, they were just for decoration. No one says they're just for decoration. The one actual extant archaeological evidence we have that says how it was used mentions it was adored. It was used for veneration. So if we're going to be consistent, um, historically speaking, we would have to apply that across the board because that's all the evidence we have. Okay, so you can have numerous fathers who themselves explicitly reject images in one way or the form, but then you can point to certain graffiti in a grotto and then an account of certain people venerating one image, and that's enough within four centuries to establish a consensus? No, because again, someone like Tertullian is admitting that he's the minority view. If we were to push this into in regards like, the later to totally fourth century, rejecting images. he was born in the early, early fourth century, say to Epiphanius admits he's the minority view. And so from in the sources regards, we do have, we could, actually the, put, we could actually piece together what the majority view was, and it was a kind of dulia. And both Tertullian and Epiphanius evidence that they're the minority view. Are, do they not evidence that they're the minority review, view in regards to the mere permissibility of the existence of images, and they don't make reference to veneration? No, the actual, in fact, St. Epiphanius literally explains that, oh, but they tell me that they don't worship them, they just merely honor them. So he actually doesn't say la dulia, but that is for all intents and purposes the Lachie Dulia distinction. So we he mm, actually explains mm. how they were used. Okay, okay. So we have a couple we have a couple of sources which we make inferences from and that's enough to establish a consensus. I'll move to another question now. So okay, what actually mm, okay. How can a singular <laughs> abstract comprehensive entity of tradition even be demarcated, let alone infallible, apart from set statements? Uh, could you speak English for me, please? 
how can you have a, because the Orthodox view, if I'm not mistaken, is that apostolic tradition is one great whole of everything. I'll try to be quick. How can this be even demarcated, let alone an infallible rule for dogmatic interpretation, apart from set statements from the apostles themselves? Because the consensus of all Christian category. practice, would, w the consensus of all Christian practice would demonstrate a common origin. For example, if we don't have a prayer of the Holy Spirit in the uh, in the New Testament, but if everyone's praying to the Holy Spirit, then we could know with confidence, yes, He's God, and we could pray to Him and adore Him. Okay, so is that enough to establish infallibility? Yes, because there's no doubt that's what everyone did. There's all no right, basis I'll for doubting it. I would bring up my phone book analogy as before, where even correctness doesn't equal right. infallibility, but uh, my time's no, up. My, my phone book's better than your right. phone book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're mine. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, all right, so we finished the, the first round of, of uh, cross-examination. We're jumping to, right to the second round. Craig, you're up again for a seven-minute cross-examination of Paul. All right, so I'm going to ask again, do you take seriously the authority tradition where you would heed something that is early from a reputable authority where it could be known at least with some certainty, maybe not the infallible certainty that you want, that you I'm would heed that me. teaching? Yes. Okay. So let me ask you this. St. Ignatius in Smyrna's chapter 9 says, He who honors the bishop has been honored by God, and he who does anything without the knowledge of the bishop does in reality serve the devil. So let me ask you, who's your bishop? Uh, my bishop is the Bishop of Sydney. Actually, I forgot his name, Bishop of Sydney, uh, Anglican. His name is Kanishka Raphael. He is the Archbishop of Sydney. And so For the Anglican do you see yourself always staying within the communion of that bishop? I've only just started, so I've only just joined the Anglican Church, so there's not really much to um, to judge by yet. So you're willing to maybe split if you see something better? If there's something wrong, yes. Just as uh, Irenaeus himself says, to run from presbyters who teach error. And would you ever join a communion without, without a bishop? I was. I was in Hillsong for a good while, and I did attend maybe like well, for one week, really, this other Baptist church. Um, but otherwise, yes. And that's because I don't grant the, uh, the interchangeability of the concept of bishop today with the concept of bishop from back in the apostolic times and shortly after. And so let me ask, do you find it morally safe then in those contexts not to have a bishop when perhaps our second earliest source for the New Testament canon, which is preserved in the works of Ignatius, likewise preserves for us the teaching that those who act apart from the bishop works of Satan? So would I, so would I find myself safe in a well, in a place that doesn't have that precisely because it okay. says you're working would with I, Satan. would i find myself safe in a church that doesn't have a set structure of leadership authority no i wouldn't no can but they be referred with, with to with a bishop with a bishop and what's a bishop what's a bishop well you can't answer question question according to ignatius <laughs> <laughs> the, the point i'm trying to get out with this the point i'm trying to get out with this is that you can call him bishop you can call him pastor, you can call him shepherd, you can call him the God emperor of mankind. If it refers to the same thing, then that's what I care about. The whole point of why Ignatius would say, submit to your bishop, submit to your presbyters, is because he is in those is there any letters. Scriptural, he is, he is any scriptural or first or second, is there order. any scripture or first or second, second century document that has a self-ordained bishop? Has a self-ordained bishop? No. Well, no. Okay, so I guess you kind of stuck that apostolic succession. So anyway, where is the early church non or scripture that says affirming and preserving apostolic... Oh, wait, I'm reading the same question again. My apologies. What do you make of first and second Clement as well as Papias quoting oral traditions of Christ if these traditions were not real? I they, they, they are real. What's That's not the same thing as saying divinely infallible, the transmission of such. that's I have no problem with that. And so they could be real, but they could be fallible. Every, pretty much everything we do in our life is real and yet fallible. Everything we communicate, everything we hear. So one plus one equals two, that answer is fallible. 
my knowledge of such is fallible, but if it, in the abstract, it is either true or not. And that when we talk about the mere abstract itself, it's not really a concept. It's not really, uh, it's not really a good concept to merely talk about fallible or infallible. One plus one is one plus one equals two is either true or not. My opinion on that issue could be fallible, is fallible, technically, yes. And again, not the same thing as uncertainty. All right, what do you make of the epistle of Matthias to Diognetus? The 11th chapter is certain he's ministers of things delivered to me from the apostles and the churches, and that in the church, the tradition, the apostles preserved. What is he getting at? Mm -hmm. He's getting exactly what he said. Teachings from the apostles preserved within the church. All righty. Where do the scriptures say that, um, that what is prophetic from, the, uh, prophetic from the mouth of God is the sole foundation, as you assert? It's the necessary implication of scripture. There's the consistent dialectic of what God says, and that is what must be authoritatively submitted to, no question around it. And uh, every other source, no other source is given that authority. Just as I said, from the first necessary assumption that all sources of knowledge around us that we take must be taken as fallible unless shown otherwise. Otherwise, we have a whole host of problems in regards to religious discussion. And just life in general. Really. Now, that the, how could the church be the pillar and foundation, the truth? If God is the sole foundation, what do you what do you mean in sole foundation and pillar and foundation? You using him? Are you using him in the same? What is from the mouth here? of God? You said what is prophetic from the mouth of God is a sole foundation, but First Timothy three fifteen calls the church mm -hmm. the pillar and foundation of the truth. Mm -hmm. And in the so Aramaic, calls the scriptures the pillar and the foundation of the truth. There's different senses in which you can use even the same words. When I say the sole foundation with respect to the word of God, I mean that the sole inspired source, the sole inspired information that cannot err uh, no matter what. Whereas the church is would, the would sole pillar and foundation of the truth. And yet, as attested by history, the church can make errors because the church is not one monolithic entity, but a rhizome of many interdependent congregations, regions and such all of which have the capacity to err, and yet by God's providence, the truth prevails. Where in the scriptures say that by God's providence, church prevails through all these disparate church bodies that are not in communion with one another? It doesn't have to say that. That's just the reality. It's just the observed reality from what we see in the church history, in the based church on, today, based on what especially authority? in the early church. Based on whose authority? Based on whose authority, it's not even a question of authority. It's just observed reality. The church, especially pre the councils, was not this one entity with a singular governing body. There were many, there were many regions of churches, and they did try to come to consensus, and they considered themselves one great body. But ultimately, they were semi-autonomous or really, truly autonomous regions. All right, but the but the consensus and other matters is not dependable. I see. Are you aware that Justin Martyr, Athenagoras, Aristides, Ignatius, they all spoke of consubstantiality? They usually actually use the term what substance? Mm -hmm. Can you quote them to me? I could, not in 30 seconds, but yes, I could quote them. You could go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com and find the pre Nicene uh, wow. consensus on, on that term. Um, who in the church preserved Protestant? Who in the church, my last question, preserved Protestant doctrines in the year 1000 if you feel that the church has an authoritative role in preserving correct teaching? What Protestant doctrines are you talking about? Any of them. Which one? Can you point me to one? Full of And your time's out. Right, so no one well, actually, no, I'll answer. I could, I could refer to, and I probably, you probably would greatly disagree with me. I could point to Victorinus, for example. I could point to Clement of Rome as uh, evidence. I said well, the year 1000, not the year 350. Church is Sorry, pillar year 1000. Be, you said after 1000. I thought you said, you said one, after 1000. Okay, well, I haven't studied that, right. so I can't give an answer. All right. All right, guys. Uh, so we are going to jump back into Paul. Paul, you are up for your second round of cross-examination of Craig. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so this is interesting. So Craig, what, just to start off with, this would be a more curious one. What evidence would convince you that either sacred tradition was in fact not sacred, i.e. infallible, or that there simply isn't such a monolithic body of infallible tradition, oral? That's a very good question. I think what I would need would be this, those passages and in, in the pastoral epistles not to exist. I think due to their existence, we are compelled to believe it. We have to, even if it doesn't even seem to like it is true, because we have to accept the teaching of the scriptures. 
Okay. So how do those passages, so let's say, what was one of the, what's one of the key passages you reckon that demonstrates apostolic tradition? Give me a moment here. Wrong thing. So first, obviously, is one of the first Timothy. Uh, how about First Timothy? Well, we'll go with uh, First Second Timothy two two. That way, I could correct the passage, uh, the citation I gave. The things that you've heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, great. So does, is that, is, where is the promise in that passage that there will be a monolithic entity of oral tradition in the abstract that will never fail to be preserved, especially by a specific group called the church in any way for only one passage, all we have more than, more than one passage that effect. It's just what's normative. Okay. So how does a norm, how does a normative reading there get you to the infallibility of an oral transmission? Cause that's the only thing I could be certain of. Is that's the norm of teaching the scriptures? Everything else, I can't be certain of. What do you What do you mean by that? How can you be certain of the infallibility because of this oral transmission? Because an interpretation of something that's just logical could work because it's logical, but my understanding of logic could be fallen. Your application logic could be incorrect. But if this is the normative, exclusive teaching the scriptures on the matter, then I could take that with absolute confidence. So with an infallible confidence, you ha can have an infallible confidence with your human mind. Well, I'm not arguing for the infallibility of Craig's mind in this debate. Well, that isn't that what you, isn't that what you require to say that you could have an absolute confidence? Cause I distinguish that. Again, infallible I think we're getting pretty esoteric. I'm just saying the scriptures simply say, this is how tradition's preserved. And there's more than one passage on it. It's not a one off. He writes it to different people. He writes it to the Romans. Mm. Um, Christ speaks it to the apostles. This is obviously something they preserved. Yep. Then first Clement talks about it. Mm. Uh, Ignatius infers it. So Irenaeus says it explicitly. So it's just, this yep. is what everyone says. What reason would I have to doubt it? And I don't, and I'm not telling you to doubt it. I'm simply asking, how do you get from, please trans trees up, uh, sorry, preserve what we're saying. Uh, and it, there's, it's just an assumption that he's saying, oh, by the way, primarily orally, but let's just grant that for a second. Preserve, preserve what we're saying throughout. Oh, by the way, you're never going to, you, you will not be, you'll this, sorry, this oral chain that we give is going to be incapable of error. Where does it say that? Why, why should I believe that over simply believing that? He gives the command to preserve and the church is able to do that. That doesn't mean that they can't make mistakes along the way that can be rectified. Why, why should I not grant that with the passage? Well, no one's denying individuals can make mistakes. What we can't deny well, is that, that the normal means that, that this doctrine is preserved is in the church and it's through the means of those who they've appointed, appointing other people, giving them that teaching. Mm -hmm. So that's what okay. normative. Yeah. So for you, so for you to assert that there's a time where this stops would actually take what's normative and say, this no longer applies anymore. And that's impossible. I'm not, saying anything stopping. I'm, I'm not saying anything stopping. I'm simply saying that there could be an error. So can an individual bishop err? Of course. Can a local council err? Yeah. Can a, what's the, is there anything between that and, the, and an ecumenical council or am I? Uh, I mean, there's, you could talk about the robber councils. If you want let's, to let's, let's jump straight to it. Can <laughs> ecumenical council err? Uh... No. Okay. Where is that divine authority given to an ecumenical council by the apostles or Christ? Because the ecumenical councils consensus of all believing Christians. That's and why that's what's normative. Christ, if this is what everyone Christ, believes, then that's what's normative. And where do Christ the apostles say that? the consensus of Christians will be infallible in everything they believe. Again, that's an appeal to endless specificity. I'm pronouncing word wrong. I think it's a pretty basic is, premise. No, and, and it's a pretty basic word that I botched. The, 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 the point is that what we see in the scriptures, if that's the only thing we have to believe, we've seen all the other sources and those interpreting scriptures, what everyone believed, we're just going by what everyone always believed. Now, you might not agree with that epistemology, but that's the epistemology that is supposed by all the church fathers that speak mm. on this question. Well, that's something I actually greatly challenge. Let's say, you know what, let's go to that. Let's say, for example, Irenaeus. So where does Irenaeus speak that everything that the, that the, that the, churches, the churches believe, 
all the churches agree with this and he's at a very early period. So in fact, I'd probably be he's doing his method exactly if I was in his position. But he says, all the churches agree with this. So, and of course, this is confirmed by the scriptures. Therefore, you Gnostics are wrong. Where in Irenaeus's argument does he assume an infallible entity of oral tradition that can never err apart from the scriptures? Um, against heresies, chapters, uh, book three, chapter three, chapter four. He literally says that people have recourse to old ancient churches and they agree in all these matters. Okay, so why can't I, do I not, can I not do the exact same thing? Like not with, notwithstanding my exact positions, but do not classical Protestants, for example, make the exact same appeal to the, uh, to the consensus of early testimony as a reliable marker? Well, yeah, as long as you're consistent with St. Vincent de Lorenz with antiquity, universality, and consent, then yeah. But they're not consistent. Well, well, here's the thing. The fact is I can make that exact same appeal as Irenaeus, and yet I don't, and yet I still nonetheless, that doesn't get me to accepting an infallible oral entity past through all ages, does it not? How does it get me there? No, it does, because you have no doubt in your 66 book canon, maybe for the purpose of debate, you're like, well, I'm not totally sure, but no one in the real world really feels that way, treats it that way. So the fact of the matter is you do have a I'm view not... of infallibility, and then you you selectively take it off for the things you don't want to view as I... infallible. Well, I don't. I don't pretend that my, my, my views on anything are totally infallible. I believe we can have moral certainty, but uh, that's time. I think you're changing All right, guys, words good... other words. <laughs> yeah well your mom <laughs> good stuff guys man appreciate the the quorum you got the share very very energetic i like the uh the, the level of energy uh, it was high but went too high wasn't too crazy so good stuff guys yeah. appreciate the uh the cross exam examination i'm sure the audience did as well so now we're jumping into closing remarks and audience uh while these guys are doing their closings make sure you get your your questions in because after that, we're going to be doing some Q&A. So that's it, Craig, you're up for your five-minute closing. And I will start right, your time when you have, begin to speak. Usually, I have a lot to say during a closing statement in, in a debate. And for all the debates I've done, this is the first one where I'm like, I feel like I've said everything I have to say. And I think the big reason for that is that when it comes down to it, I think that we're operating from very different premises. I think that my intercolluder is looking for a very specific definition to a very specific word, which really doesn't apply at the time that we're arguing about. And so if you're trying to look for that, then there's no debate. But if we're just going to pull rhetorical fast ones, as I already began the debate, the fact that there's a canon of scripture, everyone accepts it. There's no table of contents in the scriptures. That means for all intents and purposes, we accept an infallible canon, all right? And if you say, well, I'm not sure if it's 66 book, 65, 67. I know like reformed thinkers like R.C. Sproul said, we have a fallible book, of, a fallible collection of infallible books. The point is no one, there's not a single Christian soul that they doubts the gospel of John. Let, let's just be honest. I, I think we got to cut around a lot of the fluff here. And once we cut around that fluff, we go, yes, there's stuff that Christians are absolutely certain on. That is infallible, that we know that Christianity is always preserved and we don't need to get all fancy with stuff. Canon scripture is one of them. Salvation through Christ Jesus is another one. The Holy Trinity is another one. There's, there's tons of these that, that honestly Protestants just presume upon if they are honest with themselves because they're not going back to the drawing board and trying to figure out Trinitarian doctrine all over again. That's just not happening in the real world. For the purpose of debate, people say it, but I'm trying to speak to the real world here. And in the real world is that the scriptures and the earliest church fathers, decades I, before even book of Revelation was finished, decades afterwards. So it's not like I'm pulling guys centuries later. I'm purposely pulling all the earliest sources you could possibly gather on this issue. And they all teach there's an apostolic oral tradition. And in teaching this uh, apostolic oral tradition, they teach exactly how it's passed. And they teach exactly how it's used in interpreting the scriptures. All the things that align with the orthodox view of sacred tradition. And so going to this argument that, oh, well, nothing seems specifically enough that it can never go in error at any point. Well, actually, the fact that St. Irenaeus presumes upon it's dependable and you have recourse to all the churches, the apostolic tradition. The fact that St. Apollotus teaches that even stuff he hasn't taught, God will guide the church so that what hasn't been written down will be preserved by the church. 
There actually are little things saying that the church will be preserving these things without error by the grace of God. They using the word infallible? No. Because again, that word didn't exist. And so if we're going to have this debate, we have to look at, well, what are the concepts they are using and does it apply? What I think what uh, Paul is doing ultimately is he's being inconsistent. I think he's shown that he's wiggled quite a bit. We're saying, oh, well, in the year 1000, I just don't know enough about the one year 1000. The truth of the matter is, Protestants believe between a very large slot of time of centuries that there's no known entity, even individuals, just like, Maybe there's invisible people somewhere that believe the stuff that we find important. But yet, how could he really honestly hold the First Timothy 3.15? That God's a pillar ground of even a local church, let alone the church. Just so people know, the Greek doesn't have a definite article, so I'm not going to make the, the debate hinge upon whether there's a definite article there. And I think ultimately speaking, it's because Paul doesn't mean it, but it's because he is defending a tradition but he's defending a fallible tradition. He's defending an innovative tradition that's not even from the Magisterial Reformation. It's one that's came centuries later, particularly in the United States. This idea that, you know, there's this invisible church and that, you know, there's uh, these um, ideas of doctrine that are held by these people, but not church entities. You go to Europe, you go to England, they're Anglicans. You go to Germany and the Nordic nations, they're Lutheran. You go to the Dutch and they're Dutch Reformed. Right? There's state churches. This sort of vacuous idea of Protestant Christianity is historical innovation even in Protestantism. And so that's why I feel, because he's so wed to this anachronism, he can't honestly deal with verses like 1 Timothy 3.15, not on purpose, but because it would require forfeiting a tradition that he's presuming upon. But if we presume upon the tradition that we actually see in the scriptures, the tradition we actually see in all the earliest fathers, then we have no issues. You literally see what St. Vincent de Lorenz says that was believed by everyone uh, from antiquity and consent with universality, all that stuff. You actually see it there. And it's consistent. That's what everyone always believed. Now, in a different debate, we get into the specificness of ecumenical councils or icons and this other stuff. But what it comes down to it is I ask you, the audience, what is the simplest interpretation of scriptural evidence? And it's there's an oral tradition and it's dependable. And I'll rest my case. All right. Thank you so much, Craig, for that closing. All right, Paul, you're up for your five minute closing. I'll start the time when you begin to speak. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlon. And thank you for giving me the full screen so I can look like I'm the real author bro here with my cross, my beard and my actual icon of Jesus, funnily enough, with the Lord's Prayer. So uh, maybe looks maybe I can uh, sneak in a little bit. <laughs> so much I could say. I think this does, as Craig is saying, that's right. We are arguing from very different premises, but he, 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 as he said there, he's saying that um, Paul is so wed to this tradition. He has to be, he's inconsistent in applying his standards, um, inconsistent in interpreting the scriptures, not taking the simple sense and all that. Well, for one, with those passages of scripture, for example, regarding the church, the pillar and the foundation, the truth, church is dependable, the church passes on the apostolic truth. I've said numerous, numerous times, I'm so happy I put this in the opening because I think even viewers now, are going to be able to see it that craig is consistently conflating the assertion of dependability of right and wrong with infallibility and yes it's true that's right the 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 word infallible wasn't used by like early church fathers for example you could probably find something that does functionally uh mean that with uh in the greek or whatever i can't think in the top of my head but point being we don't need the word we just need to know the concept is there and we can see that in scripture, the assumption, but also the direct assertion of there being no error in what God says. And that's all I'm asking for. It's actually really, really simple because contrary to what Craig says, it's not, he's not taking the simple sense of, oh, well, I'm just simply, I'm just simply saying what well, first Timothy three and such says about the church, church is the pillar of the foundation of the truth, church is independent. That's not the same thing as saying, therefore, it is divinely protected from all error for all time. That is not the same thing. I think I, I think it's a very simple um, thing to consider. I mean, remember what I mentioned again about the whole issue of a phone book, uh, where your phone book can be 100% without any errors, and yet that's not the same thing as divine protection. And so in practical terms, it could mean that one day maybe a phone book edition could be an error. And then not to mention, of course, how I made it very clear, church tradition General, generally speaking, or church traditions rather, because that's actually something else we can see in this debate as well, of the non-existence really of a non of a single monolithic entity of oral tradition. We, we can see Craig; he's, he takes the 
the his interpreted implications of a couple of fathers from within three centuries to say, therefore, there was a consensus on divine images, on venerating images. Again, despite the protestations, the the protesting of many other fathers on the issue, which you can you can even find on his own channel, for example, when he talks to another anarchist, and and so that's the, that's the problem there. The taking where he will on one hand say that I'm importing these categories and fallibility and all that stuff, and yet he himself is directly importing the concept of divinely protected infallibility into statements like the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth and exhortations of the apostles to carry on the divine truth into the future, which is 100% true. I don't deny that. And what was one of the ways they did that? By preserving the exact words of the apostles, the words themselves being inspired. And yes, there was also an oral passing down. And yet, as we see from church tradition, church history itself, if that's all we had, then there would be no foundation at all because abstract ideas get confused. People make mistakes, even if they're only tiny, but they can accumulate because they're primarily fun- they're primarily founded in our own minds. And we see that throughout church history. We see that in the very debates in the fourth century when the homoousios position itself was a minority at certain points. Where was the sacred oral tradition there to infallibly that everyone apparently knew that told everyone homoousios was true? That was believed by the apostles. The simplest explanation for that one event alone, not to mention the whole issue of images, is simply that there wasn't a monolithic body of infallible tradition. And once again, not the same thing as denying dependability. We can have great moral certainty on many things that the early church, in the earliest times in particular, states that are nonetheless not stated directly in scripture, perhaps only implied, for example. We can say that, for example, about the office of bishop, about how the apostles themselves established bishops as a means for continuing the ministry of the gospel, that there would be succession within that, not not necessarily granting the whole idea of apostolic succession as developed in the East and the West. That's It's just all I'm simply saying is that we can have this great certainty. We can have fantastic foundations on the traditions of the church, on what they say, on what they pass down to us. And yet it's just a simple premise, a simple necessary assumption that anyone can err, anyone, any group, including an ecumenical council, which is really where the core of this ends up coming because that is claimed to be an instrument of infallibility. And yet nowhere is that given the power to summon conditions that allows the church to speak infallibly with a divine borderline well really a revelatory insurance without actually calling it revelation that's all i'm saying it's a very simple premise and i do believe that my opponent missed that today all right good stuff guys i appreciate the debate and the audience does too great job appreciate you guys so now we're going to jump into the q a uh the rules for q a both of you guys will get one minute each to respond to the question no debating back and forth because that does not allow for us to pound through different questions so once you get your question in that's it all right <laughs> so let's jump into it i have a couple super chats here and we'll answer those super chats first and i have a super chat from dr bob thank you so much dr bob for the super chat appreciate your support and is there a canon of tradition if so is tradition god breathe if that uh why can i pronounce that word man if the episcopate episcopate yeah episcopate defines tradition how do i know how do I know which episcopate is correct? Uh, is I guess. That for me I, it, yeah, I, I assume. Craig, I guess that's for Craig. Go, yeah, Craig, you go for it, man. All right. It's is there a canon of tradition? And yeah, there's a rule of tradition. It's just what the rule, because that's all canon means. It's what the church has always accepted. What has consensus, like Saint Vincent de Lorraine says. So we do have that. We have it in our practices. We kind of covered that during this debate. Um, whether it's God breathed, no, because God breathed is a very specific kind of inspiration. And uh, Orthodox believe that there's um, the quote, St. Nicodemus Hagerite, there is literal inspiration and then there's like illumination and then there's superintendence. And so essentially, a lot of things that people think are inspired are just superintended by God. There are people discerning and grappling God with things of God, but what they eventually write or say is what God wanted them to say. And so that's something where it comes down to uh, tradition. 
we believe that councils, for example, are superintended. The tradition that's correct is what gets preserved by the council. And in, in a way, similar to Acts chapter 15. All right, Paul. Um, yeah, so I think Dr. Bob here more meant a canon of tradition as in a, as like the canon of Holy Scripture, a full set, a comprehensive set of all uh, sacred tradition, in which case I'd say that that's genuinely a good question. And uh, really, at best, one could probably say, as far as I'm aware, for Orthodoxy and, and for Rome, really, for all these other ecclesial ecclesialist uh, ecclesiologies that I'd, I'd, I'd coin them, that um, it's there, there may be a canon, but it's ever expanding. Um, so the best I could, the best I could probably say for orthodoxy, for example, would be that, and and, and Rome actually, that there is a, a canon of infallible articulations of sacred tradition. But with respect to sacred tradition in and of itself, which is the ideas themselves, there's not really because the only way you can end up categorizing that in a canon is to actually have the the words themselves undergirding it, these infallible words, whereas a abstract ideas are well, just just that abstract ideas and what constitutes that um you know in the ends up being explicated by explicit words but then those things themselves are not the tradition per se and so it can get really really odd and this just undergirds all the massive controversies with rome in the east where they say no we got the divine tradition no we got the divine tradition and really because of the major ambiguity on many issues in terms of history even up to the earliest period of the church it ultimately ends up just going to well my thought my authority good your authority wrong therefore this is the sacred tradition that's ultimately what it ends up coming down to just the sola ecclesia all right and here's another super chat here thank you king danny for the super chat appreciate the support uh i think this is toward you paul why don't protestants i think he meant put he put but but put the same criteria on the traditions like the solas like they do to ancient traditions of the church we do we 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 do and the key criteria really would be uh what is found in scripture which assumes that scripture can be intelligibly understood by people of sufficient learning for example um not to say that every individual has the capacity to perfectly to even well understand scripture that's not the assertion but that the person with sufficient learning can come to understand scripture and so with that respect with that criteria we simply say okay let's let's see what the tradition is and even then this is a false dichotomy between the solas versus the ancient traditions of the church totally false dichotomy because we would say especially classical protestants would say that the five solas are the authentic ancient traditions of the church even if they eventually got muddled over time by a large portion of what calls itself the church which gets into the the whole problem of how do you define the church who is the church you know um and so so no we'd simply we'd simply say yes we do use the same uh, standards it's called the testimony of holy scripture and even using the testimony of the earliest of the church to help us account for uh, what is the what is what may more likely be the true understanding of sacred scripture? Now, of course, a necessary entailment of my own position would be that it is theoretically possible that an alleged consensus, which is always alleged because we don't have a comprehensive survey of every bishop or layman, um, could be incorrect on something, and I don't have a major issue with that, so long as God does nonetheless preserve His essential truths throughout all time. And so, yeah, it is with the same standards we study Holy Scripture. Um, we're informed by good hermeneutic, good reason to um, come to whatever the truth is. And we do affirm many ancient traditions. So uh, not really a good premise to begin with, with this question. All right, Craig, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the, I, I think it's persistent. It seems like we have, well, the solas, we affirm this because my view, the person scriptures, the, the solas, yet... Yeah, they aren't the simplest interpretation of the scriptures. They cherry pick the fathers. The fathers read in context the consensus of surviving documents because we can't do a poll of people, but we can do essentially a poll of what has survived historically. Um, we disallow for a lot of these Protestant distinctives, um, which is why they depend upon saying, well, the church is something vacuous and we don't know what it is, or, you know, the, the church is, you know, the Christians have lost most of this information. And at the end of the day, it's because Protestants, their criteria is what lets them preserve their tradition. And to be fair, most Orthodox, most Roman Catholics, most people that just wed to their tradition, what, what more people need to do is actually be obedient to the scriptures and the consensus of the saints say. And then if we do this, what we don't have some vacuous thing of, 
who's the church and what's the correct doctrine, what's traditional. We have actually quite a bit of consistency. All right. Next question here, and I think uh, this is not really a, a question pertaining to the debate topic, but it's a super chat nonetheless. I probably won't shut up about this. <laughs> For Paul, ditching Aussie accent, when? What you got, Paul? Um, oh, so much to say about that. I've got to keep it Christian as well, so it's hard to respond. Um, ditching Aussie accent, when? Um, when? when Canada becomes a half decent place to live in. So never. <laughs> Craig, you have any thoughts, man? My thoughts is these two last super chats are cheap. They robbed you a penny. Why did this whole dollar amount? <laughs> oh man, I appreciate all the super chats, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's hilarious, man. It's all good. It's all good, man. It's all good. We have some more questions here. All right, this is for you, Craig. Uh, Craig is. Uh, can we infallibly know exactly what is in sacred tradition? Yes, consensus. If it's something all Christians believe that lived that lived and experienced the church is that sacred tradition. All right, Paul. And uh, that's, and I'd simply say, no, we don't. We as humans do not have infallible certainty. There is always a fallible step in the chain. Um, if he simply wants to say, in reference to this thing, can this thing be infallible? And then Craig will say, yes, the unanimous consensus is, is infallible. Then that's a, that's a coherent answer in his, in his worldview, of course. But of course, when we're talking about infallible certainty, that includes our own minds. And so that is our interpretation of the unanimous consensus. And to repeat once again, for everybody watching, Denying infallible certainty does not mean denying solid certainty, foundational certainty, moral certainty, the like. It just means that it's theoretically possible that there could be an error. doesn't mean that there is. doesn't mean we even have good reason to believe there is. That's not the same thing. Um, but then, of course, as a product, I'd also deny the premise that there is such great consensus on certain things that Orthodoxy and Rome would claim are uh, key doctrines for themselves. And thus why I would say that the appeal to consensus has at best a very, very, very limited uh, application um, if, if, because there are very, very few issues in which you can say there truly is a consensus. And even then it begs the question on consensus of who, who are we measuring? Are we measuring church fathers or, oh, Craig shaking his head again. Oh, the silly prot saying his prot things. But it's true. This begs a question on who are fathers, who's included in the consensus um, because we can see, for example, in discussions online regarding the uh, veneration of images that uh, certain Orthodox and Romanists will say, oh, well, Tertullian and Oregon weren't church fathers. So that's eh, OK. We can we can dismiss them. They're not they don't count. They're not part of the consensus. They don't affect it. Um, I'm, I don't think Craig does that. Nonetheless, that does happen. Oh. And uh, the fact that there is circularity involved with consensus <laughs> does, I believe, make a problem for that uh, issue for that uh, standard. All right. And here is another question here. Uh, I'll we'll just throw it for both of you guys. Did the Jews have an infallible or tradition magisterium at the time of Jesus? Paul, you want to take this one first? Um, yeah, clearly they didn't. Um, that's, <laughs> there's not much, not much else to it. The tr alleged traditions they preserved, as Christ himself says, they were the traditions of men. They were not divinely inspired. They contradicted the words of God. Um, and this was all very much promulgated by their magisterium, the same magisterium later on that would compose the Mishnah and the Talmud, um, which are obviously very false and at, at points blasphemous uh, documents that are clearly erroneous. So I'd simply say, uh, no, they didn't. And yet they nonetheless had the word of God and Christ expected them to know what the word of God was and how to understand it. All right, great. Well, the saints don't have an answer on this question, so it'd be asking for a speculation for me, and one which I'd have to make with less surviving historical documents. I mean, study who has studied uh, pretty much Judaism, ancient Judaism, those that we have very limited documents, and the vast preponderance are actually the scriptures themselves on that question. And just trying to infer what we see from the scriptures, I'd say the answer is yes, because like, what was the authority in Job the long suffering's time? Um, this obviously is not to be conflated with the, uh, the sort of bastardized sort of traditions made to just for men to justify themselves that Christ criticizes. But for example, we, we could glean that the, the Jews venerated, um, 
venerated their dead and prayed to the saints and prayed to angels. We find this in Jewish sources, and then not coincidentally, we find this in early Christian sources because they got it from Judaism. And so that would require that, yes, there was some sort of oral tradition because the documents we have from Judaism that preserve this are not scripture. Most of them are not scriptures, but they're uh, contemporaneous with that era of Judaism. So I believe that would be the best historical answer to the question. It may not actually fit the sort of uh, preconception that people's theologies demand, but it's the honest historical answer. All right. Next question here. We have a question for Craig. You said you determine tradition by the consensus of the church. How do you know with infallible certainty you've interpreted the consensus of the church correctly? This is this is very good question. And this is something where I've uh, I've told Paul and I've told other people. I used to post when I was on Facebook and the Patricia for Protestants group. And we got to be honest, Orthodox, Roman Catholics are less consistently. You play with a loaded deck. Your deck is loaded with saints. Their saints are canonized. And so the opinions of people not part of that de deck are sort of irrelevant. Now, I think what outsiders wrongly make, and this is a wrong historical judgment, is that, oh, like, this is this deck is so loaded, it's completely historically irrelevant. And I don't think that's a historically honest answer to the question either. Like, when people quote Origen or Tertullian, they're like two people amongst the, the 10, 20 people that are, are canonized saints that people actually quote on, on numerous questions. And so, yes, the Orthodox way of addressing these things would be to go to the saints. And the reason for that is because uh, we shall know them by their fruits. The sanctity of people is what gives someone authority. It's what gives Christ and, and the apostles teaching authority. So why would that example change after that? So someone like Tertullian or Origen may be important historically speaking, right? You know, you don't want to get rid of historical documents. I, I'll quote all sorts of documents that are contemporary and not necessarily saints, but they're not the binding authority ultimately for Orthodox. Then a fall, a fallible authority is the consensus of saints because, in a sense, it's the witness of the Holy Spirit, and we cannot deny the witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul? I um, So, Cole, I liked um, Pastor Brooks' uh, question here because it was one of those cheeky ones about, oh, how do you have infallible certainty? which of course me and Craig, we don't like that kind of argumentation. So I was, I was, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Brooks, for that cheeky question. But I think it brought about um, a good answer from Craig with a lot of meat to interact with that really does um, demonstrate some great truths for us. Because he's, he's, he's right when he says that with the Orthodox Roman Catholics and all that, there is a loaded deck in regards to uh, who you consider saints and all that. And so they make up the consensus and therefore that loaded deck consensus is what, oh, you're a cat person? Come on, mate, really? <laughs> the um, and they and that's what determines infallible truth in the in the church at least one of the mechanisms for that and i'm glad he acknowledges that because of course I, I can return the favor and say that hey we all operate with a loaded deck i'd argue that the protestant loaded deck is smaller and much more solid in foundation but nonetheless everyone plays with some kind of loaded deck and so i'd i'd personally simply say that um i could grant literally everything that that craig said there because it's it, it exemplifies one of the key things about this debate that i believe um that I don't believe he addressed well with with simply saying with taking me as saying when I say look there's the issues like oral tradition and the unanimous consent of the church whoever these things can be highly reliable and authoritative in some sense and yet not necessarily infallible they could they could make an error at some point and by God's grace we could determine we could figure out uh, where that error may be and. And so I, I 100%, I could 100% grant those criteria. I still personally think about the, the the role that the fruits of the spirit play in regards to intellectual authority on the faith. But nonetheless, I could still grant that and still deny Craig's core premise. Um, so yeah, because because authority can be something that's simply a default. A husband has authority over his wife. Does that mean he's infallible? Obviously not. Likewise with matters of faith. My, my household teachers... is. Oh yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, nonetheless, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Have... I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. Oh, of course I'm infallible. Um, but, but yeah, it's just the same with teachers of faith. Someone could be most holy man, most fantastic of their fruits, absolutely impeccable in their scholarship and research. And yet they can make an error. It's as simple as that because they do not have the divine authority of a prophet or an apostle. It's, I, I think it's a pretty simple premise. All right. 
And here is a question. Craig, they're coming after you, man. I'm trying to find a question for Paul, but I don't see any, man. So that's all we got, man. For the ecumenical councils, why does a majority uh, consensus on doctrine necessitate infallibility? Could the majority in councils ever be wrong? Paul go. In Acts chapter 15, we see how they deal with a contested question. And it kind of requires, really goes back to Acts chapter 10 and 11, because that's the deal with the baptism of Cornelius and how St. Peter is addressed with some skepticism over uh, baptizing um, Gentiles. And St. Peter speaks of, so when we read Acts chapter 15, they quote the scriptures, they look at the example of St. Peter and the fact, when we read Acts chapter 11, it says that everyone accepted the answer St. Peter gave. And so then we also see, now back to Acts chapter 15 on the same question, that it was good to not only just the apostles and the elders, but to everyone there. And so we see this idea where there's antiquity, we see consent, and we see consensus. And so the canonical definition of the ecumenical council, what separates a true ecumenical council from other very large councils which did exist, is precisely that question. It's what we see as normative in the scriptures of there being antiquity on the question, there being consent on the question, and universality on the question. That's exactly what we see in Acts chapter 15 and how they settle a doctrinal issue in council. And so if people want more detail, they could read the definition of the ecumenical council in session six of Nicaea 2, where we have that. And we could read also going back to before Nicaea, um, St. Constantine the emperor, where he says that one cannot doubt the consent of all the world's bishops teaching X, let's say. And so we see the same principle at work over centuries, and lo and behold, it's in the scriptures. All right, Paul? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd simply say that that is reading a bit too much into Acts to say that, hey, look, it references that all the all the elders present with the apostles at the uh, at the Acts Council, the Council of Jerusalem, they all agree with what was said. Therefore, that establishes a positive principle that these elders in the future rather uh, can come to a consensus and thus have an infallible establishment. I think it greatly begs the question because there's one major factor of the Jerusalem council that other ecumenical councils simply never got. And that is that there were living apostles directly granted divine authority by Christ himself, the ability to not err. And nor do I see anywhere in the passage that it says that this agreement of all the elders is something that in any part helps establish the infallibility of the certain teachings is it's simply it is simply the fact that the apostles themselves came to this agreement um divinely directly divinely inspired by the holy spirit and uh, and thus were able to establish it and by god's grace all the rest of the elders uh, all the rest of the elders agreed because establishing consent establishing consensus is a good and great thing for peace um but consensus did not in and of itself establish peace you can have with, with regards to later issues on uh, consensus um if you see in a consensus for example like i'll just say like for example, early second century, if there really is a solid consensus established, that can give great, strong, mo perhaps even moral certainty that a certain belief is true. And hey, sure enough, if it coheres with scripture, then perhaps we, def we, we should believe it. But establishing a consensus from a thousand years after the fact, let's say, with demonstrable numerous periods of great change and upheaval. Um, and then if we, and if we see if something is a consensus, and yet when we read scripture, we see something that's a bit of a different picture. Um, consensus can absolutely be overturned. And so I, I do deny the premise that consensus is always correct, um, which is not the same as God abandoning his people because Israel itself apostatized from God numerous times. And yet he was always faithful to them. He loved, we loved him because he first loved us. My God is a God of the resurrection. So no matter how much of the visible church apostatizes, well, one, I, I don't believe that everybody will ever apostatize from what is absolutely essential in truth. But nonetheless, great swathes, I do grant, can uh, can uh, can fall into great error. And yet, my God is faithful, and he can bring us back into the truth, a la the Reformation. All right. And here's <laughs> another question here. And Paul, if you want to take this one first, is the Catholic tradition right, even if it is wrong? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, let me try to... Trying to conceptualize what he's trying to get at here. 
this is a as the apostles said this is a great mystery who can understand this um <laughs> hmm, I, I, i'd say maybe if it feels wrong could it be right i don't know yeah i think i think we're trying to get at I... here yeah i think what he's trying to get at is um even if uh, the Catholic tradition teaches something that is like contrary to scripture or something like that, is it right still? Cause it's tradition, you know what I mean? Well, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether it's Orthodox or Roman Catholic tradition, whatever, they simply deny the premise that tradition ever, their sacred tradition ever could contradict scripture. Um, so then they would nonetheless say that if, if tradition was wrong in that it contradicted scripture, then they would say, then yes, in that case, it would be wrong. But they just simply deny the premise that sacred tradition ever is wrong. So um, it's, a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit of a category issue, you know? All right, Craig. I mean, I think if we add sacred tradition, a lot of these things, if we actually applied it, a lot of these uh, passages of scripture would be pretty easy for us to interpret consistently as everyone interpreted them, that we have an extant evidence. Um, but what it comes down to it is I think what this is getting at is we have to have some level of doubt where if, let's say, everyone, including like some early reformers, believe that the Theotokos was perpetually virgin. Go, I don't see this in the Bible. To not, you know, to not poo-poo that, oh, there's actually some pretty mm -hmm. good typology which would require that sort of biblical interpretation. But like, oh, well, my, my modern Protestant tradition rejects that, so I consider that ridiculous. But yet people for tons of years, including Protestants, didn't consider it ridiculous. You know, th this includes lots of issues, like Protestants that believed in um, praying to the saints and stuff like that. It, it's just, I find it very interesting that everything is so wrong in our own eyes, right? And that's just reliving what we see in the Book of Judges, where everyone did right what was right in their own eyes and not submit to the authority God gave. And I think that's the warning that book is trying to teach. All right, so we have a couple more questions here, then we'll shut this thing down. So this question is from Reform Presbyter. Uh, what differentiates the apostolic written tradition and apostolic or traditions, which are eventually written down, like the canons and ecumenical councils, or of ecumenical councils? Now, Craig, you wanna take this one first? Yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's actually a very good question because People are used to approaching this as the Roman Catholics do. Um, James White covers it in the Roman Catholic controversy, where the majority view of Roman Catholicism is that there is a oral tradition, which is like pretty much mutually exclusive from the scriptural tradition. And it's not that like one's an interpretive source or something like that. But the Council Trent avoided outright dogmatizing that view, which kind of gives the Roman Catholics some wiggle room. But that's what most people think about. When we read the actual dogmas of the Orthodox Church, it actually conflates the oral tradition with what the councils teach because they see it as interpretive, just like we saw in the mold of St. Vincent. And so ultimately speaking, what differentiates a written tradition and oral traditions are, are, are simply just the time where something's written down, right? Like, for example, if there's something in a liturgy, Maybe the liturgies are first written down in the fourth century, with maybe the exception of St. Hippolytus writing a few lines uh, here or there. But they all agree on this point. So no one really thinks that, oh, like all these other basic things they all agree about, they're all way later. You know, we know with good historical certainty that, yes, they are very early. And of course, the Orthodox would believe it's because they're apostolic. And so the ecumenical councils, when they show consensus, this is not something that is coincidental because you're not going to get people all over throughout the world to agree on the same thing unless they were all preserving in their respective areas the correct teaching. Now, this gets way into the weeds where we'd have to do a whole show on, well, how about the use of force and these sort of high-handed tactics and ecumenical councils? I know more about that than a lot of people in the English language because I've actually read all the minutes of these councils. And so I cannot really address that right now. I would say the general principle is because everyone has this practice and then they could go meet in one place, go, yep, we all believe this practice. We all teach this thing. That's how we know that it is actually an apostolic tradition. All right, uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it is good to get back to the whole question of like the role of an ecumenical council, how it, uh, how it is a, a functional like snapshot reflection of the consensus of the church and, um, yeah, for the, from this question itself, it's like it, it is a good question. 
because so much of alleged oral apostolic tradition is fundamentally just stuff straight in scripture. But then, of course, they'll mention, like, if you look at the St. Basil quote, for example, he'll say, where does scripture ever say to sign in the cross or where does scripture ever say to pray towards the east? And it never does. So he, he would conceive of oral tradition as at least in part composing things which are truly are distinct from the claims of scripture. Oh, Craig just r- r- shaking his head like that. It's not what it says. He flat out quotes scriptures. Come on. <laughs> when he says I'm not things. saying he's not. I'm he saying he's like, I'm sorry. Because people just quote All that right. passage so much. It bothers me. <laughs> but he does say that it's not found in scripture. Whatever. Yeah, my but answer, my answer. Flat out quotes my answer, Craig. Scriptures where he gets them from. Yeah, I'm not saying right, he never guys. does. I'm just saying let my answer. My answer. <laughs> so, it's good. It's a good example because then we can we can point to times when there really isn't an actual consensus, like with um, well, just before and then of course during the whole Second Council of Nicaea, like people like Craig, obviously very well aware of this. There was a whole Council of Hieria before that, and um, which had many bishops. I think just as many as Nicaea too, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken myself. Um, large, large number of bishops, and then of course even after Nicaea too, still massive conflict with other iconoclastic regions. Um, to the point where any concept of a consensus is really brought out meaningless, which is why Second Nicaea would have to bring up that whole criteria of, oh, they didn't have any of the five patriarchs present. So it's not really, so it wasn't really any more, oh, well, they, there's a consensus. It's that, oh, well, the big five guys, none of them were present. So therefore that's okay. And we can just dismiss massive chunks of the canonical church who deny the veneration of images and if we just exclude them and just look at us, oh, cool, consensus. There we go. So I think that demonstrates my point quite aptly. All right. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't read, I see it so, too. <laughs> so we're yeah, gonna... yeah, your mum, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make that the final question of tonight. So good job, guys. Appreciate you guys coming on the Gospel Truth. I pray that you guys got a lot out of it, man. You know, this is, uh, once again, a very uh, a controversial topic, you know, when it comes to tradition, things like that, especially within the overarching universal church, if you will, you know, this is a very controversial topic. So I hope you guys really got a lot out of it. And I look forward to getting you guys back on, uh, perhaps, uh, for a different type of debate, different topic. Um, that said, uh, would you guys like any, any words, leave any words with the audience before we, uh, far close this thing out? Paul, Craig, uh, don't rush to it. Who wants to start? All right, I'm going to oh, quote Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Why not? Whatever Go your ahead, name Craig. is, get ready for the big surprise. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul? Hey, nice ominous last oh. words there. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give ominous words from a, from a very wise man in, a pre, in pre-Christian uh, religion of Israel to quote the good legend himself, Jesus of Sirach, when he says, fight to death for the truth and the Lord God will fight for you. There's some great wisdom there. I absolutely love it. It's a great book. It's not infallible, but it's a great book. Nonetheless, you can glean much wisdom from it. And uh, that's all That's all I'd say. I think this debate, um, as, as much of the, as much, conf- as much um, how would I say, questions around our premises and categories still remains, it nonetheless advanced this conversation a bit more further because now we're getting into the weeds of what is infallibility? What is the role of the church? What is the consensus of the church? How does the spirit guide the church? And um, as much still remains to be clarified, we made some good headway today, I believe. Yeah, and I, right. and I want on that note to say, like, it's nice to have a debate where Second Thessalonians 2.15 doesn't come up once, you know, on this topic. Yeah, because yeah. That, <laughs> that's all people, or, or, or Irenaeus saying Jesus is 50 didn't come up once. It's like, finally, we can talk about <laughs> this and, and actually talk about something substantial. So I do think that this this debate was the cutting edge on this because it's going to force people to actually go deeper and not on that surface level stuff. And so it's been a real pleasure and honor to be able to do that here on this channel. Likewise, All right, cool, likewise. guys. I appreciate you guys once again, and I'll be in contact with you guys, man. If I got something else I think can fix your lightning, I'll be in contact with you to let you know, see what you think. All right? Lovely. Sounds good. All man. right. All right, you guys. Take care, and God bless. All right, another great debate in the books. And once again, uh, these topics can be very complicated, very difficult. Uh, could be definitely be a labyrinth of difficult concepts. And and so it's important for us, um, I glean from what Craig just said, you know, to not just hover on the surface. Uh, it's important for us to be able to 
dive deep, dive deep indeed, and really pick up some books, pick up some documentation uh, to really understand these particular positions that you are against or if you're for it. You know, don't just take somebody's word for it. Dive into the history so you can gather a better understanding. Perhaps you're wrong and all it takes is a little diving into these traditions and diving into these uh, these the, the backstories to see if, uh, if what you believe is true. And so I just want to thank Craig and Paul for coming on and I want to thank you as a live audience. I want to thank you for joining me and uh, and jumping on here. You know, um, a lot of what the gospel truth do is um, uh, is, is supporter is, is provided by the supporter, right? Those who support the ministry uh, financially and with the subscribe, um, it's hard to do. You know, it's hard to do without your help. So I thank you for all the help and thank you for those who supported the ministry with a super chat today. And uh, so. You know, that said, I am getting ready to get out of here. And um, once again, dive deep, take your time, study what you what you believe, and gain more knowledge, man. Because sometimes that's a, that's the defining factor. Sometimes, man, it's a it's a lack of knowledge. And so, go ahead and dive deep into this study. All right, that said, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you for joining me in this episode of God's Truth. May God bless you, and may God keep you. Don't. Oh.